Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's that time again. Your favorite time of the week, which is almost every day now. Where you get to see me be mean to people. Because as a complete psychopath, I get pleasure out of just being mean. I live to be mean. Mean is whatever makes you feel uncomfortable. Whatever your feelies scale dings off at. If your feely scale is hitting a seven right now, it's because I'm mean. We all know that the KGB sorcerer, when he's in the house, there's about to be some mean sh dropping. It's about to get hype. Because as you know, all I do is scream and talk over people. Because I have no arguments and I don't know what I'm doing. And that's why it's going to be so easy for any hater or challenger or debater who would like to step on here and they can have the, they can have the mic for as long as they want within reason. These are the, these are the rules. You guys know the rules. Today's topic. So no, rule number one, stick to the topic. Not interested in slam poetry. Not interested in your new rap beats or your bars. Not interested in uh, your secret society. It's an open forum debate. Catholics, atheists, Protestants, Muslims, pagans. We're going to talk God. You can even bring up geopolitics. Dissenters get prime place. If you dissent, if you disagree, you can have the front of the line. So please, let's not do the same old people that have called in uh, for the last five years. When I say dissenters get front of the line, that does not apply to the three or four people who try to call into every stream. And I'm not interested in debating with you or interacting with you and you know who you are. So I'm immediately going to boot you. I know your voice is not going to work. And I, I'm not fair. It has nothing to do with being fair. We've had hours of years of discussions with you people. And I'm not interested in any more discussions. So to the Gnostic dude that calls in every time and to the evangelical soul scripture debate guy, if you call in for the 10th time, I will merely boot you. You are wasting your time and my time. There is no need to continue to make profiles. No one is interested in joining either your made up Gnostic church or your church or your Protestant thing in these circles. The debate was had a long time ago with you guys, and we're moving on. Anybody else, however, you're welcome. You can have the mic, and when you get the mic, that means you can just argue, argue away. Now, there are some other caveats. If you don't make arguments, I will interrupt you. And if I ask you a question... I will interrupt you until you answer the question because we're not in a formal debate setting. If it was a formal debate, you would have time to do your presentation. I would do my presentation. We would have rebuttals and there might even be a cross-examination. We're not in a formal debate setting. We're in an informal debate setting, which still has some kind of conversational rules, right? So if I interrupt, it's not to interrupt for no reason. It's because, hey, wait a minute. Let's go back to your claim, blah, blah, blah. You may claim blah, blah, blah. I want you to back up that claim. I want you to give the evidences for that claim. I want you to give the proof for that claim. Support, supporting data for the claim. If you can't do any of those things, I'm going to keep asking you to do that. So understand what a basic argument is. An argument is not arguing with people. Totally different things. An argument is, here's my claim. Here is the syllogism or the evidences or the bases to back up the claim. That might include scholars as scholarly sources, which can attest to things being true or false. They don't necessarily prove a thing to be true or false, merely citing a source or an authority, but they can help bolster your case. So you got to have some familiarity with basic fallacies, informal fallacies before 
I'll let you just charge forward with your machine gun diarrhea spitting of claims. So remember, debate includes rules like a chess game. You don't just come to the chess game and start playing checkers, you say. Debate is governed by the rules of thought. The rules of thought, a.k.a. laws of logic, fallacies, and so forth. <laughs> so try to keep that in mind as we open it up. The way it works is you can call in on Twitter spaces. If you're in the chat, the link is in the show description. It is the Twitter space link. Twitter spaces do not work on PCs. It only works on cell phones. When you come into the Twitter space, here's the link, you request to speak. When you hit request to speak, it gives you the microphone and I will call your name and give you the ability to speak. You're going to automatically be muted. Guys, when I say, Billy Bob, you're up, it automatically mutes you. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, what, what do we do, everybody? It's like a third grade class. Let's repeat after me. Unmute yourself. Ready, children? Unmute. Please don't make me sit here and say, unmute, for the whole five-hour duration of this. All you got to do is request to speak. I will give you the thing. You unmute. Speak away. It's fine to ask me if you can hear because sometimes there's a delay. So remember people in the chat that think I'm being mean. You're just talking over people. Look how mean you. No, there's a delay depending upon whether that person is on their cell phone. If somebody's on their cell phone and they're on the road or whatever, there's going to be a delay. And so there's going to be a little bit of talking over them talking over me or me talking over them. It doesn't always happen. It really just depends on that person's signal. So don't bitch at me when there's talking over. Part of that is the delay. We are adults here. We're not children. That means that if you say really dumb things, I will make jokes. And if you get your feelings hurt, it's not the place for you. Also, an argument is not you're a KGB sorcerer and you work for an ISIS cult. And you're a human trafficker, right? This guy that called in the other day. So none of that's an argument, okay? Those are crazy claims. Maybe you can show that I'm a KGB sorcerer. I'm just saying these things. None of that does anything. All, it, all you do is give clown world attention. Like you, you become the clown world, which just gives more traffic. So you become the clown of the day and people love that. Now, it would be nice if we could have coherent, rational thinkers, but we always going to get these feral people, people with, they got a little bit of rabies going on or something. They feral. So here we go. So the way it works is call in really simple. People are like, why do you keep saying this? Get to the point. Because it never fails that it's that no matter how many times I say, I might as well just not worry about it. I might as well just get used to explaining it every single time. But I mean, we've been doing Twitter spaces for like two or three years now. For probably hundreds of hours. Okay. So it's open forum. I give you the microphone. You request to speak. We're reserving it for the people that have not called in. If you've called in a million times or in 30 different previous live streams, I'm not going to go to you. First up today, Mr. Bleepy. What's up, Bleepy? Hey, Jay. Yo. Can you address the argument that Muslims make that because the apostles of the New Testament spoke Arabic, or Arabic is the most like divine language? And well, hold on, like you, you cut out, can, you cut out. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Can you address the claim, the argument that Muslims make that because the apostles spoke Aramaic, that therefore Arabic is a divine language? Uh, well, that would be a non sequitur. I mean, that's like 
why why wouldn't we say the Hebrew is a divine language? Because the prophets spoke or wrote things in Hebrew. Yeah, they basically say that, you know, Arabic just has like a better expl- explanatory power in terms of like all the you know the different qualities well if that was the case if that was the case then why did uh even medieval islamic thinkers after the kalam have to have to use uh greek philosophical categories yeah that's interesting i just got stuck in that point when i was talking to a different muslim yeah i mean how are we supposed to say what language is quote more divine i mean this just seems the the claim that was made was that well the apostles used aramaic okay but arabic is not identical to aramaic correct so on what basis is aramaic therefore more quote divine than hebrew i mean it just seems really subjective and arbitrary yeah i mean but a lot of islamic argumentation relies on this kind of really super low tier type stuff yeah because I think you might encounter that because they seem pretty committed to that position. Okay, well, yeah, let's hear why that is the case. Uh, and then that was the case, and we should all be speaking Hebrew. Red pill rapper. Hello, hello. Hey. Hey, Jay. I got a question for you. So um, I've heard your one of the refutations on the papacy being that. Um, they're kind of just pushing the interpretation down the line. So the papacy promises um, that they can interpret scripture and the canons and all this stuff. Um, And yet you're left as the individual who has to interpret the interpreter. Um, Mm -hmm. Is that a fair characterization or? Yeah, that's one way of putting an argument that I've made many times. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just having a hard time wrapping because I get that. I think it's a good argument, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around why, that same accusation couldn't be leveled against um, the Orthodox interpretation. Like, uh, cause I know we don't have the Pope, but we do still have the church to interpret scripture for us. And we have the canons, but if I have a theological question and I go to my priest or even my Bishop um, and he relays the information of, to me, as far as how a canons applied or what a scripture means or something like that, am I not in the same position as the trad cat who's trying to figure out how to interpret the interpreter? Yeah, that's the point. The point is that Roman Catholicism and the office of the papacy don't give you a privileged position. Everybody's in the same boat. That is the point of the argument. So then how are we not in the same boat as the Protestant left as the private interpreter? Because between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, the issue is not uh, do we have individual certitude. Every one of those systems is going to claim to give the individual certitude. The question is about whether uh, what what means the Holy Spirit uses to give that certitude. So in the Roman Catholic system, you're supposed to get cert. Can you mute when you're not? You got a lot of background noise. Guys, when you're not talking, just mute and then come back on whenever you're ready. Uh, so between the Roman Catholic, the Protestant and the Orthodox person, all three of these claim that at in the final analysis at the end of the day, what grants certitude is the Holy Spirit speaking to the individual. So while they all grant that, the difference is the means of how the Spirit does that. In the Protestant view, they think that the Holy Spirit is leading you as you read your Bible. So it's you and your Bible, right, primarily. For the Roman Catholic, the certitude is the Holy Spirit supposedly leading you to interpret the papal documents. So when I level that criticism against the Roman Catholic, it's a criticism of the incoherence of their epistemology as a whole, as a system. Okay, It's not saying that we're not subject to having to interpret the documents. The point is that precisely we are all in the same boat. And so therefore, saying that we have the office of the papacy and these mountains of papal documents doesn't actually do anything to clarify and give certitude. It just knocks the problem back a step. It kicks the can down the road. So that really doesn't help us. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't. And the reason I make that point is that Roman Catholic apologetics so often stresses that the papacy will provide certitude. The papacy will provide clarity on these issues. But in fact, in actual practice, it doesn't. In history, it doesn't. 
In the 20th century, it doesn't post-Vatican II with all the, un, the lack of clarity in the post-Vatican II church. And in epistemology, it doesn't actually do that. It just kicks, it moves the problem back a step. Okay, now you're uh, interpreting the papal documents, which are not any clearer than the ecumenical councils. And the ecumenical councils are in a, an extension of an interpretation of the scriptures. So we're all working within a milieu of many different documents, many different things, the liturgy, etc. So the question is, rather, what separates us is the means that the Holy Spirit uses. For the Roman Catholic, the Holy Spirit is guiding the individual through the papal document, supposedly. For the Protestant, he's guiding the individual Protestant through the biblical documents. For the Orthodox person, it's holistic. We're being guided into the truth through all of those things that encompass the Orthodox faith. The liturgy, the Bible, the church fathers, the ecumenical councils, the lives of the saints, etc. All of those things constitute the means by which the Holy Spirit teaches us, catechizes us, and gives us dogma, and gives us certitude. And there's really, it's really just confusing existential certitude with objective public normativity. And those are two different topics. But Roman Catholic apologetics often trades on confusing those two domains. It's kind of like a bait and switch. It's like an offer. It's like a car salesman telling you, we're going to solve this problem for you. You can turn your brain off. You won't have to struggle with theology anymore because we've got the Pope. See? See how easy it is? That it doesn't do that. Well, yeah, that makes sense. But then, so how can we claim certitude? Like, especially if we were to get into something complex like the, you know, the essence energy distinction. Or, yeah, there's no, you know, there's no other terms. way to certitude other than the Holy Spirit guiding the individual throughout the process, throughout these texts. There is, there's no other solution to that. And that's not Protestantism because Protestantism denies the Holy Spirit in the history of the church as a means of guiding the individual. So do you see that, you're again, you're confusing two different problems. We agree with the Protestant and the Roman Catholic that certitude is ultimately granted to an individual by the Holy Spirit, but you can't turn off the individual and his own action and work and process of getting into the topics. So if I'm, if I'm looking for certitude that I'm interpreting the interpreter, like say, like Justin Martyr or one of these interpreters throughout his, the history of the church, um, is like the certitude that I have, like, how do I have certitude that I'm interpreting the interpreter correctly? Is it just through, there's no uh, other way to get it than working with me as an individual. Yeah. There is no other way at the, in the final analysis for a you subjectively getting cert certitude than by that being given to you through working through all of the, the stuff. There's no other way. You can't get it by osmosis. Right. So, do, okay, so you have to do sense. the work. So we, would, we would just lean into the fact that it's hard to understand. That doesn't mean it's false. Is that, Would you lean into that? What? I don't understand that. So like I'm talking about some of these more complex doctrines. If I'm looking for certitude that I'm that I have the doctrine correct, that I've like uh, I've interpreted some of these church fathers correctly. Okay, but look, um, it's not like the Protestant and the Roman Catholic options don't give you that. Just saying something like the papacy, right? right. All the papacy does is, is give you, on the one hand, criteria for dogma, like a structure of magisterium, ex-cathedral ex magisterium, uh, universal ordinary magisterium, ordinary teaching, and then fallible opinion, right? So you have this category structure, but you still have to, as an individual, read through the documents and put them into the right categories, hopefully, right? So, so we can't claim certitude? No, man. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic view. Do you understand that? Sure. What, what you're asking, you're confusing two categories. Individual subjective certitude is a different question from whether or not, or not a public office of the papacy can give you certitude. You said that those are two different categories, two different things. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm with you, yeah. So in the, at the end of the day, everybody will have to rely on, in some way, the Holy Spirit leading the individual and giving them certitude. There's no, you can't get it any other way. You can't magically get it through the papacy. You can't get it through Protestant scholarship, right? So subjective certitude is ultimately going to have to come through the Holy Spirit. 
But the means that he uses are going to differ because the means that we use, and the point I'm trying to make here ultimately is that what's the means that people used in the first thousand years of Christianity? It couldn't be the papacy. That's why I was asking that girl the other day. I was like, how do people in the year 300 know what the true church was? You think everybody in the Roman Empire could just figure out and, and send an email or look at Rome's website to see what Rome was doing that day? Of course not. So how did they know what, where the true church was? They had to interact with the local church, you see. And they had to figure out, okay, well, here's a Gnostic sect. Here's a heretical sect over here. He's an Arian sect. Here's the Orthodox Catholic group, right? There's nothing, that's, there's no osmosis that's going to automatically tell them which one's the right one until they start to look at the information. So you can't bypass looking at the information. But mountains of information is inescapable. So at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to grant a certitude is the Holy Spirit. So where, where in all of that did you get that I was saying we don't have certitude? Well, because um, you're talking about subjective certitude, but like that doesn't mean it's that, that doesn't mean you're not. It's the, so an individual becoming having certitude. By when I'm using subjective, it doesn't mean not certain. It doesn't mean not objective. That just means you as an individual, existential certitude. Hmm. You think I'm? Do you think I mean by that that it's not certain that it's subjective and relative? That's not what that means. Yeah, I guess I'm just nervous. Like my subjective certitude, like how sure I am of something. You know what I mean? Well, to, to make an object an objective truth claim like the Orthodox Church is the one true church, mm -hmm. um, if I'm leaning on my own individual certitude, that that makes me nervous, especially like to go into a debate. You know what I mean? Well, your own subjective certitude is not identical to your feelings at that moment. It's predicated on argumentation and and objective truths and evidence. Those are, in, those are inseparable. They're not mutually exclusive things. I'm not going to have, yeah, that... I'm not going to have individual certitude without knowing the objective argumentation and the facts. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you answered my question. I appreciate it. Sure. All right, man. Have a good day. You too. Yeah, good questions. Norkel Groiper, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up? Hey, how's it going, Jay? Um, I had a quick question regarding uh, a Protestant take that I've came across a number of times. Okay. And it's sort of this uh, one they often say, they don't even claim the term Protestant. But rather just like a, I'm a basic follower of Christ. I don't claim the term Protestant. I'm not a Protestant. There were believers in the early church that uh, weren't part of the apostolic faith. I didn't follow the, the early church and the church fathers and stuff. So I was wondering if you could just quickly respond to that because I understand it's kind of a low tier take, but uh, oftentimes they're very ignorant to that. And yeah. I was wondering if you had anything to say on that. Yeah, so the fact that, remember to mute when you're not talking, guys. So there is no such thing as lowest common denominator, I just follow Jesus. I mean, there, there's nothing in the teachings of Jesus where we get like, oh, these are the things, the three or four sentences that you have to believe. The rest of it doesn't matter. Because even in the Protestant doctrine of inspiration, all of the texts are inspired. So they're all divinely authoritative, right? There's no such thing as lowest common denominator Jesus. I mean, and Jesus himself teaches a lot of things. There's nothing that self, that there's no de facto, oh, well, I know that these three ideas are the ones that I have to believe. I mean, Jesus says you have to be baptized. Jesus says you have to be in his kingdom, which is the church. He set up an authority structure and a teaching authority in the church. So how can you, there's no such thing as this. This is a made up idea. And an easy way to demonstrate this is that most evangelicals will agree that they have a different Jesus from the Mormon Jesus or from the Jehovah's Witness Jesus. So just the name itself doesn't mean anything without 
the context and the referent being the correct Jesus, you see. This is why natural theology doesn't work. There's no such thing as generic lowest common denominator God. Oh, we all believe in God because it's just this, uh, you know, image of an old man in the sky or it's uh, three or four of the uh, attributes uh, that we all agree on or whatever. No, it's the whole system. There's no such thing as half Jesus, partition Jesus, part of Jesus. So you have to, I would say, just critique the presupposition of the evangelical there that there is such a thing as lowest common denominator Jesus because simply doesn't exist. There's only one Jesus, and it's the one who set up a church in history. And you can't, there's no such thing as believers who weren't part of the church. I don't know where they're getting that. In fact, in the book of Acts, in what, 8, 9, 18, 8 and 9 and 18, around in there, the apostles who find disciples bring them under the episcopacy. So when they find people that are not fully instructed, like John's disciples who had never heard of the Holy Spirit or whatever, they bring them under the episcopate. So this does their their fictions that they're thinking of don't actually exist. And every one of them is going to have to qualify their quote Jesus when they're encountering any other cult or sect out there like Jehovah's Witnesses. Right. Thank you. And uh, one more thing. Uh, so I'm Catholic, but I've just been recently looking into Orthodoxy more. And I was wondering if you had any good book recommendations of like church fathers. That's kind of good introductory. Yeah, I think the best place to start with the Church Fathers is uh, something like the letters of Clement and Ignatius, and uh, then to read something like Irenaeus uh, Against Heresies, starting from book three, maybe. The first two books are a lot of categorizations and classifications of endless Gnostic sects, so it's, get really, it's, it's really boring. So I would start maybe later, book three or so. Uh, it's good to read Athanasius on the Incarnation as an introduction to the Church Fathers. And then from there, I would read the Cappadocians, particularly Basil on the Holy Spirit and uh, Gregory of Nazianzus' Theological Orations. So those are the best places to start the Church Fathers. Awesome. Thanks. And you will notice, by the way, that when you start to read them, and after that, I would read the Catechetical Lectures of St. Cyril Jerusalem. You'll notice that you do not find them um, simply deferring to the papacy. They engage in all kinds of apologetics and note that their apologetic is not the way that modern Roman Catholics do apologetics. Why might that be? I wonder, could it be that maybe they didn't have the same system, the same church as the modern Roman Catholics? Something, something to think about when you read those documents. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Good questions there. All right. We got a uh, left field guy. What's up, left field guy? He's coming out of left field. Hello, hello, Jay. How you doing? Yo, yeah, what's up? How you doing? Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So I, I don't want to assume you hold any belief. So, um, are you a Christian? Uh, it's better, I find it's better to ask questions rather than to assume uh, views or positions. Yeah, Orthodox Christianity. Okay, okay. So, um. So is this alternatively at the same time going out to some radio station? Not that I mind being heard. I just out of curiosity. Yeah, we're on uh, WWKQ105 out of Nashville. No, I'm joking. There's no radio. It's on my YouTube channel. It's not on, it's not on radio. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So uh, I, I have some um, questions. So is this um, the, is the reason you do this um, and I, I do some mild activism on my page as well not that i'm plugging myself and getting people to follow me but is is your main thing here that you want to bring people to christ or christianity or get them to change their mind we do a lot of things over here we do movie analysis we do geopolitical analysis uh not really activism more of a intellectual educational approach to questions uh, and then part of what we do is uh, debates and apologetics to defend Orthodox Christianity. So, yes, that's part of what we do. Sure, sure. And um, I think, so, so with me, I think it's good to um, change minds. Because I, I, I think, you know, every now and then, if you change your mind, then you remember that you have one. But um, So I think you would agree with me that it's... Yeah, I've changed my mind many times. Mind, yeah? Sure. Okay. So in the spirit of it's good to change your mind... What would possibly make you change your mind that Christianity is the true religion? 
I don't put you on the spot there, but no, I don't care. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. It's open forum. Anybody yeah, can so make any challenges what, or questions. What, what would change your opinion that Christianity is the truth? Um, I think if there was another worldview that was better at giving an account for the fundamental aspects of reality, ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, uh, or if there was some sort of, you know, massive internal contradiction within Christianity that was demonstrable, that might make me question it or rethink it. But, um, you know, I've not heard those things yet. Sure. Um, I mean, my position is just to be open. I'm an agnostic atheist. So my, my own take is that um, it's, um, I mean, sometimes people think agnostic and atheist are the answer to the same question, whereas we're all agnostic because gnostic by definition is to do with knowledge. So we are agnostic. We don't know if there's a God or not. So theism and atheism, those are positions of whether you believe it's true. I don't know if, if you've heard this point. Sorry if I'm yeah. repeating myself if, you, if you've heard it before. So, I mean, yeah, I understand so, the difference um, between the terms. Sorry, so. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. I said, yes, I understand the difference between the term uh, atheist and agnostic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say, um, I, for me, I am z about 0.0001% convinced that there is a supernatural deity um, presently existing. So, see, what I find interesting is just from looking at religions and God, is that, um, so, not every religion has a God. I think about two-thirds of religion have a God, but one-third of religions are atheistic i.e. Jainism uh, or Buddhism. Um, but what I find interesting is that every religion has an afterlife. So for me, the question isn't that should be asked is not whether a god exists. I think the question is of psychology. So I think what religion does, I mean, you may disagree with this opinion, I think the idea that you have an afterlife is the greatest marketing gimmick ever made. So this, um, and you can come back on this with your own thoughts, it's the idea that, oh, you're so special, you're so supercilious, you're so amazing, you know, after you die, that's not the end, there's a continuation, there's a there's a um, cinematic universe where you're involved, where, uh, you know, films are made for eight years or uh, for infinity, so I think it appeals to our human ego where we want to think, oh, I can't just die and become maggot buffet, you know, I'm going to be... I'm going to, you know, I have to get this sort of VIP ticket to this eternal theme park of paradise and it's going to be wonderful and I'm going to see my grandparents in young age. And, you know, it's, it's like a utopia. So I, I think that is, that, that's very appealing. Like, So, very yeah, can, can, I yeah make a, very can I make a statement? So, so I just say one last sentence and I'm just, thank you for the time. So um, I think that's very appealing because the idea that you just die and then you get eaten by worms. It's it's sort of um, minimizing yourself as you are. But yeah, you, um, so I'll come to the question now. So would you, if you was being, I mean, I don't see no reason why you shouldn't be honest. You seem like a sincere person. So would you say that that appeal of, yes, Jay will have an afterlife, if I believe, do you think that is some uh, level of your reason for belief? So what you did, and I don't, object to you asking those kinds of questions but sure. what you said was really just a psychological report and an emotional appeal neither of which constitute an argument or have anything to do with whether religion and the afterlife are true or not okay well i, I don't i don't, I'm, I'm no reason to think it's true because i've seen okay but wait a minute whoa whoa, whoa. Every... but uh, grant i understand so you're i understand that you question theology religion the afterlife that's fine but the yeah. argumentation that you gave was a psychological report of where you think the, des the, the desire for that to be the case comes from, from human desire and ego, and yeah. what we call an emotional appeal that people believe this because they want to, and they're, they're you know, it, but none of that is an argument. No, this, I'm saying it's the reasoning. I'm not, say, I'm not saying why you should believe or not, but what no. I want to know is that appeal, like, the idea that so can, let's put it this way uh, my response to you is that i believe that god's existence is objectively provable and that there's a logical philosophical argumentation that can demonstrate that so what all of what you said is neat but doesn't have anything to do with whether or not god exists or whether or not there's an afterlife you just gave again an emotional appeal which is a fallacy no i'm saying the appeal of emotion is to the theist not to me 
because he appeals to that person. That has nothing to do. It does nothing to. That's it no, it doesn't. It's, it, that's a. Do you understand what a fallacy is? It's a, an emotional appeal is a fallacy. No, I don't know it's a fallacy, but I think the fallacy is for the theist because it's not a fallacy emotion. for a theist yeah. because it's not an argument against the position. It's just a you're reporting about how you think the the belief arises. But that has nothing to do with whether yeah. it's true or false. Okay, but what, what, what I'm saying, to, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about, I've seen people die, and they pretty much stay dead, so there's no reason to, fi- I'm not seeing, I mean, uh, you believe in Christianity, so... So, what, we only in, believe the things that we've... Only, for three days, you believe that on faith. So, we only, no, I don't believe it purely on faith, we, you, so you only believe the things that are, what, locally, visibly, phenomenally present to you at the at this moment? I know when it, when it comes to um, objective claims such as God, um, then or or an afterlife. I mean, it doesn't make sense if you look at it from a scientific point of view because anyone who's anyone who's gone into a neurology clinic can see that a brain that is slightly damaged, we lose all our primary senses, our memories are affected. So the idea that if you've got a body rotting in the ground for thousands of years, and then it's going to resurrect, and it, that person is going to come back in there in their original form with the same personality that just there is no sort of rational basis for thinking that like, well I, bet, know, I mean what you consider yeah. rational and what you consider possible is already based on your presuppositions and your worldview and so if you're committed to a naturalistic worldview then i need to know how you can make knowledge claims at all given your naturalism okay well we make knowledge claims through i mean there's um um, empirical claims there's 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 ways to there's ways to test like um i mean if someone is pregnant you can do a pregnancy test and it's pretty much yes or no and then you can also do sort of like ultrasound or whatever and you can see the embryo so do you, like, so you're so you're saying a, as an empiricist yeah. so you think that basically all human knowledge comes from sense data when it comes to objective claims yeah hmm. how do you know <laughs> how do you know the cl- how do you know the claim all knowledge comes through sense data is true from sense data because it's it's not circular reasoning so for example if someone writes in a book that evolution is true um and uh, that would not mean evolution is true you can um or for example if someone says coronavirus is real it won't be true because it's written in a book by an epidemiologist it will be true because you can go and do uh, yeah, but I'm asking a different question. You don't understand. You're not. You don't understand the question I'm asking. It's no, no, no. It's you made a universal. It's so, in the book. You made a universal yeah. claim. All knowledge is from sense data, and I'm saying that it's fundamentally contradictory. And I can show you that because you mm-hmm. can't show that proposition to be true from sense data. There's no sense data that tells you that all knowledge comes from sense data, and that's your governing presupposition. But I, I would not regard faith as knowledge. Did you not hear? I, I, that has nothing yeah. to do with the claim. I just criticized your belief, your claim. How is that mm-hmm. criticism not devastating to your epistemology? Well, I mean, I'm not here to talk about my epistemology because I mean, there's certain I am. ways of me nothing. Yeah. So you're making I, knowledge claims that, that are the basis for why God doesn't exist, and I want to know how you have a justification for knowledge claims at all. And you just gave me a big contradiction. So I'm not getting how you have knowledge at all. I don't, I don't understand which way, where, where you saw the contradiction. All knowledge comes from sense data, you said. That proposition no, itself, objective which claim, is a... Objective claims. Okay, yeah, all objective, objective, objective claims objective. come from sense data. That proposition itself yeah. is not a truth that you can find in sense data. You think it's an objectively true statement, don't you? Yep. Is it found in sense? Is that true? By, by, by the, uh, Are you listening to me? You, people never listen. They just blow past. Is the proposition itself in sense data? Sorry? The proposition I, 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 itself. I, 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 all it's objective it's knowledge comes from... Can you not answer the question? Can't understand. It's a very simple I'm argument. Do you know who David Hume is? It's a critique of David Hume. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm not familiar with okay. David Hume. Look, you I, said I, all objective I'm, knowledge I'm, comes from... Sense data. Do you want me to ask you for the fifth time? All objective knowledge comes from sense data. Where in sense yes. data is that proposition itself? Well, you can see, you can, there's a way to, you can test things. So, for example, I had COVID and then I did The proposition myself. itself. I'm not asking about, it's, 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 you're it's not, not answering the question. Quiet, 
it's not verified by me testing it. So you can do it. You can test me for COVID. And How do you it's, test it's, that proposition? I'm not talking about COVID. What are you talking about? Work, COVID? The proposition itself. I'm giving an example. I'm giving an example. That's not I'm this sure. proposition. I don't the, think you understand. I do understand. You don't understand. The proposition itself, all knowledge that's objective comes from sense data. That proposition, do you understand? That's a sentence claim of proposition. Do you know what a proposition is? Yeah. That proposition, not COVID, that proposition. Where in sense data is that proposition? Stop interrupting me until you answer the question or I'm going to boot you. You're not going to answer the question. How many times yeah. must okay. I ask you, people you these questions? To, you're not able to understand, so you're putting it on me. You're deflecting. I'm not deflecting because it's a battle of worldviews and who can give an account for epistemology. That's my argument. My argument for theism is the one that gives an account for epistemology. You made a really big claim. All knowledge that's objective comes from sense data. All you got to do okay. is tell me where in sense data that proposition is known. And it can't be known because it's a universal claim. You don't have universal well, sense data. I can't explain it again if you aren't able to understand. You can't explain you anything. Are. You're not answering okay. anything. This is always <laughs> what you people do. It's a very simple question. Is it just ignorance of philosophy? I'm not trying to be mean to you. It's just like, do you not understand the question that I'm asking you? Can you repeat? Tell you what. Can you repeat to me? Can you repeat to me? We'll have to agree to disagree because you think I don't understand the question. And well, can you, can, you, can you clear that up for me and repeat? So there's no, there's no point going around if you're not going to answer the question, then I'm going to boot you because you're not. It's look, all you have to do is just repeat you're what not, are. You're not understanding the answer, but you don't want to look stupid. You don't have an answer. So you're, you're trying to put it on me. Okay. I'm not, bro, bro, I'm not worried about looking stupid, dude. You made a claim. I'm just asking you to explain that claim given your system. Do you not understand that? I've done that. Let, let, let's move on. If you can't understand, that's beyond your comprehension. That's fine. I don't understand everything about everything. So well, you just said that everything. you don't know about David Hume, but you think that this is my problem of comprehension. Uh, David Hume. I, I've never read David Hume. Uh, I know. So exactly. I so it's not a problem of comprehension. On my end. Classical quotes. It never fails when we have this question come up. No matter how many times you ask a very simple question about a universal epistemic claim, they will not answer it. They blow past it. If, you're want, if you want me to believe your empiricism and your skepticism, fine. You have a progenitor who is better and more eloquent at you in this position. His name's David Hume. You should go read him. So I know David Hume's argument, and you're just repeating it, and you don't even understand that you made a universal claim. And all I'm asking for is if all knowledge comes from sense data or all objective knowledge comes from sense data, then in your system, that proposition itself has to also come from sense data because that's a knowledge claim. This is a very simple argument. And to tell me I don't comprehend your answer, you didn't give an answer and you didn't understand what I'm asking. Go ahead, dude. Classical quotes. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't care if you're thumbing me down. If you're going to do a philosophical debate, you might want to know a little bit about philosophy. Morgan, what's up? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, hi, Mr. Dyer. Um, I was wondering, can I still participate in orthodoxy without going to a church? Because where I live does not have a, an orthodox, whether it's Eastern or Greek, doesn't have one. Uh, yeah, you just do the, you do the best that you can. I think God knows that. I mean, we have people who are baptism of desire in the church who couldn't, you know, fully be received. So yeah, you just, you do the best that you can. Exactly. Good question. Classical quotes. Did you want to try again? You're being mean. Did I not tell everybody at the beginning of this, that if you won't answer the question, I will keep bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back until you answer the question. Classical quotes. Do you want to say something? Where you at, dude? Come on.
Today is not for people that have called in a million times. Please, if you uh, are coming on, it's because you take issue or disagree. So remember, it's disagreement day. Orthonome. I mean, do I have to write it on a whiteboard? Would that help people out, what we're saying here? I thought I had my whiteboard in here. Where is it at? Whiteboard summer. Let me get the whiteboard. And what did, what did we see? The same old thing. Machine gun blow past. Let's blow past into other topics. Nope. No lazy atheism allowed here. All knowledge that's objective comes from sense data. Okay. Can we all see this? See that? This is a proposition that makes what's called a universal claim. See that word all there? That's a universal quantifier that is making a statement about all states of human knowledge. All human knowledge that is objective comes from sense data. Because that is a very strong claim when we stop and pause and think about the claim. Okay? So this is the question that I'm asking to this person. See the brackets there? The brackets are bracketing that proposition. I want to know where in sense data that proposition is. Because this claim here would include the claim itself, you see. In other words, if all objective knowledge comes from sense data, this is an objective knowledge claim. It must therefore also some, be somewhere in sense data. Of course, this universal claim is in no one's individual sense data. Therefore, it's a fundamental contradiction for basic bitch empiricism. It is an empiricist critique 101. So if you're going to come at me with worse than David Hume skepticism, I'm going to give you the David Hume better than, than you skeptical response. Because I can be a better skeptic than you. Because David Hume is a classic skeptic. Where are you at, Orthonome? Espindola, what's up? I mean, you have the microphone, dude. What's up? Unmute. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, getting my request. Uh, just for context, I, I'm an Orthodox Christian, but that's the, there's a question that many uh, atheistic or agnostic friends of mine always end up asking me okay. like, when they question my beliefs or anything. Okay. And that is that any claim made, they say, I'm trying to put it on words, but they say that if all human knowledge, logic, and, you know, empiricism and universal claims, it's all based on, it's like human creations, how can we trust these, uh, these affirmations like that? Well, hold on. First of all, how could a universal, hold on. How could a universal claim be based on human creation? That, that right there doesn't make any sense. Do, do you have universal experience? Yeah, exactly. For example, uh, if I want to prove, like, give a proof about God uh, in a logic way or, you know, in a philosophical way, they, the debate always ends up in, oh, but that's just like a human truth. You can't really prove that it's objective. Okay, well, then if, prove, if, that's the just the hum, if that's just human truth and subjective, then their own claim against it is also human truth and subjective and thus undercut. That's usually how the debate ends up, you know, so no one is convinced by the end of the, the argument. Well, but no, hold on, but they, they've yeah, just... But that's uh, you, they, that's they, your truth, you know? Well, if they reduce their position to pure subjectivism, relativism, and skepticism, then they can't say anything. 
then they don't have yeah, an ar- exactly. then they don't have an and argument against Christian. They agree with that most of the time. They say, "Oh yeah." Okay, well then you've done your job as a then you really prove that. then you've done your job as an apologist because their position now means that nothing is provable. Yeah, that's usually how the debate ends. Okay, up. well if nothing is provable, then they can't prove Christianity false. Yeah, exactly. So then uh, that's all you can do. Like you, there's, there's not something more because. You know, they just shrug it off, and yeah, we can't really prove anything. Well, if we can't prove anything, then you've done your job, and they don't have any argument against Christianity. So that's all you really can do. I mean, apologetics only goes so far, right? It doesn't, I mean, apart from, you know, the individual being open to what's true and God working on their heart and all these other factors, logic and argumentation only go so far. Uh, Ultimately, it's not a question of knowledge, right? Man's fundamental issue is not knowledge, it's ethics. Ortho orthonome. Do you want to try again? Hit on mute. Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, last time I think it was me with a nail gun, but I wasn't using a nail gun. I was banging on a table because I was doing the. People are just Matthew making jokes, McConaughey. dude. It's just jokes. Go ahead. What do you want? Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, can, hold on. Can I hold on one point? Fast. Hold on one second. Uh, just what one point. So to people in the chat that are asking the question, I was not to just to be really clear. Okay, Zach, uh, I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying, Zach. So the guy was making the the claim that all knowledge is known through sense data. My argument was not that it's weak because there's knowledge that's not from sense data. My argument is much stronger than that. It's an argument that the phrase itself is contradictory. You see, and if this is true. This is destructive to knowledge, you see. So it's a much stronger claim. I wasn't just saying it was weak. I'm saying that that's impossible. Uh, go ahead with your, your comment there, sir. Yeah, my question is, um, we fast in the Orthodox Church and we always abstain from meat, eggs, and uh, dairy, yes. And I'm just wondering if uh, I'm into the carnivore diet, uh, this all these things, and... I'm wondering if this is so nutritious and so good, how did the church come to the... Okay, so I'm not trying to be mean to you, bro. I'm not trying to be mean, but that's not today's topic. So we've done a lot of talks. You can go refer to our old videos on that. Today's topics are uh, Catholicism, Atheism, Protestantism, and Islam versus Orthodoxy. Topics are not the fasts and carnivore diet. Uh, Fula 97... Hello. Yes, sir. What's up, man? Yeah, I just got a question about um, Christ and his 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 consciousness. To be honest. Okay. So, um, I've I've heard you speak about like the Trinity has one consciousness, but it's in three modes. So, how does like Christ and his consciousnesses? Well, I'm guessing he's going to have two consciousnesses because consciousness seems to come from nature. How would that? Well, I don't know what conscious. So, co- so consciousness is like a modern you know, term that typically refers to something like just being sentient, right? I mean, an animal is conscious, a human is conscious, right? So um, if it just means like uh, aware, self-aware, being a self or whatever, I mean, the the patristic terminology is two minds. So Christ has two minds because mind is a faculty of nature, right? The the triad has a common mind uh, amongst the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they have that that common mind each in their un, in their unique mode of persons each person has that that one mind in their unique mode so in the same way because mind is a faculty or property of nature because Christ has two natures he has two mind a fully two minds a fully human mind a fully divine mind and it's the divine person that has those two minds so those two minds would be in the same mode right well, in the incarnate Christ, they exist in the mode of the person of the Logos who possesses them. That's called inhypostatized. Okay, so so would then theoretically would um, would one mind be able to think of something different from a, from the other mind? No, because uh, the the synthesis of the two natures in Christ and the hypostatic union was that they were always working together in harmony and in synthesis. There's a synergism that's always present. And so the fifth and sixth councils point out that 
the two wills, the two natures are together in a hypostatic or personal union in the person of the logos that has those two natures. So there's a divine person with two natures. All right, that's, that, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, good questions. Uh, Jacob Henri, what's up, man? Hello? Yes, sir. What's up? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you? Good, man. What's what's on your mind? Okay, so I watched some of your YouTube videos, and from what I've gathered, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that you uh, ascribe to foundationalism, but so if you have God as this sort of foundation which grounds all other beliefs ultimately— and you're aware of this God through divine revelation, and this awareness is sort of knowledge of God. And then from this, you're able to derive that through the nature of God, it can only be such that all things are kept in order. So say like the law of non-contradiction will exist through time, and someone who's maybe, I'm not an atheist, but for example, an Aristotelian atheist would run into the problem of... Uh, you know, quasi-Aristotelian atheists run into the problem that they wouldn't be able to know if the law of non-contradictions holding through time. Mm -hmm. That would be so. Well, so, uh, first point I would say is that having foundational beliefs doesn't equate to classical foundationalism. That's a specific, you know, school of epistemology that we could trace to the maybe the ancient world middle ages and particularly into descartes and a lot of the uh, enlightenment thinkers so classical foundationalism is a is a type of uh, approach to epistemology right and i uh but that doesn't mean that well therefore i don't have foundational beliefs so that's just kind of like trading on um different senses of the term there but okay, so, so when it comes to yes, Aristotle, in the, 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 yeah, I would say that there would be internal contradictions within a strict Aristotelian system that one could critique, such as the idea of an eternal dyad. Uh, you know, that's, that's Basil's critique of Aristotle. I'm sure there's others that you could pull out, too. I mean, you could critique hylomorphism and a lot of different areas that Aristotle could, I'm sure, be critiqued. So that's what I've gathered from your YouTube videos is it kind of puts them in a tough position to where it's hard to make uh, predicate universals. Yes, I would say that's I wrote a paper on that in grad school that um, Aristotle has a difficulty with numbers because he doesn't seem to view number as anything other than um, a local property of an object. But, uh, you know, that's pretty problematic if we think about the fact that you know, obviously the number seven can't be reduced to property to a to a trait of, of a local object yes um and would you clarify something for me with coherentism so you had just mentioned that it doesn't mean that there are not foundational beliefs but it just means that what the foundation is not self-justifying so there wouldn't be this kind of just direct uh, i mean if to my understanding, this is a direct acquaintance with some foundational belief that is self-justified because to deny it would lead to contradiction, but rather you could say justify the law of non-contradiction by sort of referencing things which are derived with us from it. Well, I mean, I could say God is self-referencing and self-justifying. So in that sense, I could, you know, God says I am that I am. That's a self-referencing claim because in our worldview, he's the highest authority. So it, it actually kind of makes sense that there would be self-referencing claims in our position. And Really what we're saying about like a classical foundationalist perspective like Descartes is that, well, you know what? You're actually making uh, self-referencing claims too, bro. You're pretending that you're not, but you're actually doing it. So it really doesn't matter. Of It's just two different ways to model a system. If you want to think about it as a pyramid with foundations at the bottom, I could say, okay, fine. Then it's God at the bottom of the pyramid. And then I have, uh, you know, categories of uh, the possibility of perception, transcendental categories. And then I have my day-to-day -day empirical beliefs. So there's my pyramid, right? Uh, or you could model it as a web with God at the middle of the web and then all the other beliefs connected as part of the web. It really doesn't matter how you model it. It's just the critique of classical foundationalism is precisely revolving on the claim that they have, which is usually tied to theory-neutral observation, uh, evidentialism, and the idea that there are self-evident axioms that don't require any other belief or, or reference to justify them. And so those three things 
that pop in my head about the problems of foundationalism are easy to demonstrate that they're, that, that they're silly. Well, I think the strength of your system is that it, it's, it's this revelation. It's, and it's really, it's unfalsifiable, but so is foundationalism. And what with the problems of the Cartesian system is it builds a foundation on a system which is self-justifying using its own faculties. So, well, you mean, yeah, I, it's, 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 it's like trying to, my thoughts and how do yeah. I know that my thoughts, which it's basically, well, it's, uh, look, say, look, look, you know that you know? yeah, let's put it like this. Descartes is trying to have a self-referencing system using his own finite mind. That's crazy. So I could simply say, well, look, what I'm, tr what I'm doing is saying that the place that Descartes has for his human finite mind, that's the place that we give to the divine mind, you see. So the problem is that Descartes has smushed what ought to be the place of the divine mind, providing the grounding for justification into his mind, which is never going to work because he's just simply a finite created being. So it, it, it can't a achieve the thing that he would like it to achieve, so it's not ever going to work. Um, and then there's other critiques as well, just again, that uh, saying I am, I, I, uh, I am, therefore, I think, therefore I am, or, or, or uh, I'm a thinking being, therefore thinking exists, or however you want to frame it, um, it's not self-evident, so it doesn't even get off the ground. Yeah, can I just um, add something real quick, Jake? Sure. Yes, please. The distinction between um, foundationalism and the other the other epistemological theories is not that it's self-referencing. I think Jay already hit on this. It's the idea of um, what we call doxastic basicality that each proposition or argument will ultimately reduce to a, f a foundational proposition in which that is justified by something that's not rational. Um, like, uh, that, that's what they say, so, uh, something that's either self-evident or, um, in other words, what I mean by non-rational is it can't be another logical proposition, otherwise you're in an infinite regress. So what the marker of foundationalism is that, well, then it must ground out in something that's not a logical proposition. Um, and the problems with that is that... Obviously, that ends up being viciously circular because in order for me to know that, I need to put it in a second order statement um, that's logical uh, in its, um, the proposition's uh, logical in its character. But I just wanted to make clear that um, <clears throat> the distinguishing mark of foundationalism is not that it's self referent. Every, as Jay pointed, every epistemological system references itself it just ends up being it ends up being a particular type of problem for foundationalism but it's also a particular problem um as far as what constitutes is justification even for coherentism um so what would you say the distinction is between say Someone like uh, Aristotle saying, well, if you try to argue against the law of non-contradiction, you'll have to presuppose it, and you're going to be put into a place of uh, absurdity as opposed to your system to where you say, well, these things are such because – I mean, to my understanding, I may be butchering it uh, – things are put in order because you know God ordained it as so. God created it as such because it's in his nature to do so. Well, that's fine as far as it goes. We would agree with Aristotle, but – the point that is often made is that that's, however, doesn't grant you justification. So just because you can't, just okay. because you can't, just because you can't conceive of it being in any other way still doesn't mean that the proposition of the principles is, is therefore epistemically justified. So there's further work that's needed, in other words, to show justification for that. It's interesting because you have the kind of human centric system to where the human is the foundation of, kind of seeing the system constructing the system and then you lead to someone like Descartes um, I would have to think about this more but what I had a thought in the past where you have this intention here's always dealing with the problems of his time and thus he picks out in being the things which are relevant to that problem and then Aristotle seeking scientific certainty pick, picks out things in which are relevant to his problem and I think an interesting point could be made for intentionality and how people's very desire, their will, kind of goes to construct the system itself. 
Yeah, I think in terms of uh, human, these human systems and autonomous philosopher systems, their will plays a role. Um, I think we would agree with a lot of Aristotle's ideas of intentionality and how the world will works in terms of anthropology. So I don't necessarily see a problem with the way he talks about some of the psychology and the willing aspects of things. But, um, but the question is rather, I think, the bigger issues within the systems, right? Like which of these systems is, is going to be able to give an account for metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology in the, in the grand scheme of things. And ultimately Aristotle's is going to ground out at a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of foundationalism where he says that, well, we just have to, you know, use these principles of self-evident truths because there's no other way to do a system. But as, uh, uh, as is raised in the, uh, the not the Garibay paper, the, uh, uh, who, who's the guy, Father Deacon, the, the paper that we always read? Russ Mannion. Man, uh, father, uh, not Father, Russ Mannion's paper, he makes the point that, uh, yeah, you can't, like, just because you can't conceive of it otherwise, or because you think that there's no other conceptual schema that could make sense of it, that doesn't, in the conceptual scheme, that doesn't mean that it's therefore justified. Because we maybe maybe we're in a matrix, maybe there's a uh, you know, maybe we're schizophrenics, and we just think that reality has to be this way. Right. So so you need more for to the status of justification to be met than just saying that it doesn't seem to be any other way. Do you think? And I, I don't have an issue with someone having a revelation from God which reveals truth, but do you think it it's kind of. Um, it's incompatible, it's incommunicable with a secular system that's had in today's world um, in that they could say, well, you know, it's a justification, but I can make a justification that's otherwise. I could say, for example, there's a God with uh, inverted attributes is yours. Okay, well, we don't, do, we, yeah, we don't need any old justification. It has to be a good justification. Like, so it's, it's like saying, well, I can give reasons for my system and here they all are all bad, <laughs> right? We want good reasons for belief, not, not any old reasons. So in other words, uh, a God with all the inverted attributes is not going to do the work of grounding or justifi justification for the, for the worldview. All right. I'll, I'll let you carry on. I have much to think of. Uh, thank you. You've been very helpful. Have a nice rest of your day. Yes, sir. Hey, Jake, can I ask a quick, quick question? Uh -huh. So the atheist guy that was on, um, that was giving <clears throat> a basically psychological psychological motivation argument, right. sort of like kind of Freudian. Um, tell me if this analogy uh, would be apt. Uh, so, for example, I have we have a basic need for food, and restaurants advertise and cater to that. Um, does that mean that therefore simply because they fulfill or are catering to a fundamental desire within us that they don't have food in their restaurant? Yeah. Or that, uh, there's no other motivation for us than to eat than, um, the promptings of, you know, advertisements or something. Yeah. It's like, and, and the, the, the desires and the psychological reporting have nothing to do with whether it's true or false. I think that's a great example. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We can think of all kinds of things that we might have good or bad motivations for, but that has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of what we're directed towards. Right. Let me, th let's see if we can think of something. Um, we could say the communist party, right? Oh, people only join the Communist Party because uh, they're envious of other people and they want to see equality and steal people's goods and create some sort of fair utopia. See, that's the only reason people become communists. Now, that might be a motivation or a reason for people becoming communists, but that has nothing to do with whether there's a Communist Party, right? I mean, those are two different questions. You see, the, the psychological reporting and motivations don't, confirm or disprove the exactly. thing itself it's like they're two totally different things it they don't, they don't, doesn't matter tie you would, ex you would expect also because i was just thinking about aristotle's metaphysics all men by nature fusus desire to know and one indication is the delight they take in their senses so there's like a 
the desire to know. Um, you can actually make an argument from nature that the object of intention and desire actually exists because of that. So it's not... <laughs> it's, That's a good point, you know, yeah. It would make sense that, well, if we have these desires um, and the you know, God gives them to us. So, I mean, that would be a separate category of um, a different type of argument. But yeah, on the face of it, simply um, because I have a desire that's met by an answer doesn't have anything categorically to do with whether the thing exists or not. Exactly. Um, we see this a lot too in atheist debates over the years. I've seen a lot that, well, they're, they will say things like, uh, man, evolution, there was an evolutionary adaptation that occurred at some point where humans agreed on a God figure and that's where, uh, morals and God come from. Well, an evolutionary story that describes the, or what you think the origins are of it, don't then that doesn't itself prove or disprove whether that is the case again it's just variations on the same point there's um well, it's actually a fallacy. i remember it is a fallacy class, yeah. uh it's uh it's an ad hominem um circumstantial well that guy did an emo that guy did an emotional can't, appeal can't be right because um he has this desire or something like that. Well, it's, it an, it's, an it's an emotional appeal and an ad hominem. And those two are, very, you know, as you know, are, are very closely connected because to say that the only reason you believe in Christianity is because your ego is peaked to think that you're going to be the star of a Marvel movie in the afterlife. That's an emotional appeal. That's fallacy. Well, the only reason why um, you think war is bad is because you're in a war torn country. Well, it's mm -hmm. like... <laughs> Well, whether the yeah. war is bad or, or and whether you have an argument or, doesn't depend on how whatever your particular circumstances happen to be. Yeah, exactly. Ty, did you want to say something? Yeah, thanks for letting me ask a question. So currently, I'm I'm resetting my beliefs right now, just trying to reassess and figure things out. Um, and what I've been thinking is the fragmentation of Abrahamic religions, doesn't that kind of prove that they're kind of led by man more so than by God? No. Uh, why would that have anything to do with the truth or falsity of the systems in question? I mean, let's say I was an atheist. Atheists are fragmented in their beliefs or take the communist party communism split into a bunch of different competing camps like how would that have anything to do with whether atheism or communism itself is true by the actions of the people who split um because when i hear uh, a metaphysical godly leader he he appears absent but in your what your... hold on what do you mean When you talk about the communist parties, those are just people and they all have their own objectives. But when I learn about the Abrahamic God, it sounds like there's one person in charge who kind of has an overall call it a Marvel movie. If you well, will, why would it matter whether well, why would it matter what how many people were in charge or not? I mean, if the point I'm making is if people disagreeing right in any system disproves the system then every system is disproven so in other words it's they're they're it's irrelevant it's a fallacy of irrelevance that people who claim to be a descendant of the system have nothing to do their disagreements have nothing to do with the system being true or false i think i'm just looking to some of the original leaders so when, when i think well, who, like well, who are we talking about so like adam and eve when Adam was on the earth and he was building his family, he was kind of the patriarch and in charge. And of mm -hmm. course there was, there was, there was uh, disunity among his children, but then we, we can just see examples. So like when Moses was a prophet, he unified the tribes and he took charge of, and, and made sure they were living the law. Uh, I, I, I have, I, I have a hopeful feeling that when Jesus Christ was 
walking the earth and, and sharing his ministry, that there was unity among the early Christians. So I guess I'm just looking for this unity that I see in the original leaders. It's an or- currently see it. Well, the okay. Orthodox Church is, so again, so that there is unity. <laughs> the Orthodox Church is in unity with the worship of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and that's the that's the whole point of Orthodoxy. Oh, so you're rep, you're repping. Sorry, I, I've only been a couple of your spaces. So you rep Orthodox, and you, yeah. you, your claim it's the one true church. Yes. Okay, so I've, I've I'm Represent. dipping my toes into Orthodoxy. Um, what about it with its Slavic roots? And I, I I bring that up because I'm I'm I have citizenship in the Czech Republic, and it's a pretty atheist country, and I'm. Could you give me any little gems of its I mean, history with like Russia you and, think and the Eastern? How are Greeks? Are they Slav? I mean, the Byz- Byzantine Empire was not Slav. What do you mean? Slavic roots? Oh, sorry. About? When I when I think of Orthodoxy, I think of like uh, in Russia and Eastern Europe and that. Group. Well, you said so Slavic Slav- roots. Personal. The roots of Orthodoxy are the Byzantine Empire and the Seven Ecumenical Councils. That's all uh, Byzantium and Rome. So what I always found a a little ironic is like the Roman Catholic Church, the Romans are what allowed Christ to die. So the Byzantine... The Byzantines are Romans. They're the Romeoi. If you were to go to Constantinople after uh, Constantine had it built or if you were existing in the days of Theodosius or Justinian, all the people in Byzantium would have called themselves... Romeoi and Catholic, Roman Catholic. Nothing to do with what's going on in the papacy in the Middle Ages. That's a that's a different thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I have plenty to, to read on Wikipedia. Thank you so much. Well, I would I don't know that Wikipedia would be the best source, but yeah, feel okay. free feel free to come back anytime and ask whatever questions. Anarchonome. What's up, Anarchonome? Hello? Yes, sir. What's up? Yeah, I wanted to ask a question, not really about, um, well, God, but like the church. Okay. Because, um, let's say, um, my, my, my thoughts on the church is that it's that the existence of God in relation to the church is irrele- irrelevant because I feel like the church is entirely a power institution. A what? I'm going to power an institution, an institution which concentrates power into its end. Okay. If I, I'm going to try to explain myself now. Sure. Okay. So I think that such institution uh, emerges from the fact that there are backward thoughts in society which are very useful in certain situations. So the thoughts of a religious institution is a thought which should have disappeared a long time ago, but because uh, they are still here, even though it's an obsolete idea, uh, which uh, is, it is still here uh, because uh, priests and uh, the clergy in general, who uh, have advantageous position uh, which is connected to this uh, obsolete uh, religious idea, making then they're making use of their power intentionally retain and they and by such uh, they use their power to intentionally re- uh, retain this idea in the world. So the clergy use the church to keep power, and I think that the Orthodox Church is just not better than any other church in that regard, and that they're all on an equal let's say an equal um uh, let's say you know, like they are all at equality in the, what they're doing to people which is lying to them to manipulate them get them to follow well i would say let's say that is the case um i mean if if if, a- if atheism can, can you it's really loud bro wait I- if atheism and agnosticism are the case, then and I, I take it you're an anarcho anarchist because you your name was anarcho something. 
then uh, why, why is it wrong to manipulate and control and concentrate power? So on what basis is that wrong? And let's say, again, let's say for the sake of argument, that is the case and the church is lying to everybody as a function of state power or something like that. Like, but why is that wrong? So, so what? I mean, I mean, I'll, if, if God doesn't exist and the church just serves a geopolitical power function, then, okay, what's wrong with that? What, I mean, don't humans need to be ruled and controlled? I'm not trying to be rude. You can come back in, but you're, uh, yeah, let's see if you can reply. Your, your background noise was loud. Go ahead. I feel like, well, this is wrong because it's just completely, um, well, this is the reason why power abuse is wrong. It's, it's just, well, it's counterproductive and it's, well, what, what's wrong with being, what's wrong with being counterproductive and concentrating power? And, you know, it, it's morality, it's ethics. So when you're... Uh, well, hold on. So, so yeah, who, who's morality? What ethics? Exactly. That's the question. So, well, you know, you're right. Ethics are made up. But the thing is that... Well, if they're made up, then there's nothing wrong with what the church is doing as a lying institution to concentrate There's nothing, nothing wrong with what the church is doing because okay. ethics is being made up. is not well, then, something which it makes... There we go. Well, then there's... Exactly. There's no debate. Exactly. So, Steve Exotic, what's up? Steve Exotic, what's up? Unmute, dude. Unmute. Hey, hear me? Yo. Hey, so, um, I got a, a question that's, uh, probably pretty basic and way below the, uh, okay. level that everybody else in this chat's probably is it, at. Is it on the topic? If you can ask it if it's on topic. Yeah. Sure. Well, you, you tell me. Well, I mean, the um, topic's listed. Like, it's listed uh, what the topic is. You hear me? Yeah, it's listed what the topic is, so I don't have to tell you. You can read it for yourself and see what the topics are. I'm not being mean, just stating the facts. Yeah. Well, regarding with, um, it doesn't seem like that the Orthodox Church has much of a uh, black and white statement on like uh, creationism being like earth is like 7,000 years old or 5,000 years old. Does the church have a definitive statement on that? I'd say the most definitive statements uh, relate to the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden at the sixth council. There's no definitive statement that it has to be X number of years, but there is the Byzantine calendar uh, and there is the large work of Father Seraphimo's Genesis Creation Early Man, which does defend creationism. But there's not a dogma of, like, the number of the years. But there is the Byzantine calendar. Is there a timetable on how old humanity would be? Well, I'm saying there is the Byzantine calendar, which does go back to the time of Genesis. And what would the, the ballpark time period for that be? Yeah, it would be six to ten thousand years. The creationist story. Okay, would the discovery of any archaeological finds older than that uh, disprove that theory? Well, I don't buy into the idea that carbon dating is an infallible, reliable source for how old uh, objects are, because that it's baked into it the presuppositions of uh, old age to begin with. Okay, so you would say if you were to find like, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher it. Well, go, go let me give you an example. Being there was as a, old as it is, seemingly would predate that. You're saying that you don't trust the, the dating on how old that would be? Two days ago, there was an article that they, here it is. Yeah, I'll put it up on the screen. It says, archaeologists find skull... And the parents are two different species. And when you go to the article, it has a picture of a soy man holding a skull. And it could be a skull of anything, not that guy. 
and they're saying that it's two different species. There's a, so there's a soy man holding a crack skull of who knows what. So I'm supposed to default to the fact that supposedly this has Neanderthal DNA, Piltdown man DNA, Nebraska man DNA, and another type of parent, supposedly. So I've been seeing these stories and this kind of stuff for many, many years. And you realize a lot of these are fraudulent stories, right? Are you aware of that? Oh, I'm sure. The one you just referenced was... Uh, well, I mean, this is all over mainstream okay. news. So it sounds to me, this sounds ridiculous. Okay. How are two different cavemen species the, same, the parents of the same baby? So they're just finding a bone and they're saying, aha, you see... Look, uh, look at the Neanderthal uh, parents that were two different species. So, yeah, no, I do, I do not find uh, those claims to be convincing. A wolf, what's up? I'm you, dude. Hello. Yep. Oh, thank you for taking my call, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question about toll houses. Uh, my son recently hey, so, converted. To sorry. Orthodoxy. Hey, I'm not trying to not trying to be rude today, but the topics are atheism, Catholicism. It's not uh, diet. It's not toll houses. So uh, you can read the Father Sarah from Rose book on the toll houses. Um, would you like okay, to? Okay, I apologize. It's okay. Uh, do you want to? Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. No problem. So not being rude to people, but it's just we're not. Today's topic is not uh, Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man. I don't care if you want to talk about that. I don't, we've talked about this many times. But the topics are atheism, Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam, paganism. And also, if you want to bring in some geopolitical topics, I will allow it. Uh, it's not carnivore diet. It's not the fasting laws of the church. It's not... Uh, these other things. So I'm not being mean to people. It's just not what we're talking about today. Snout, what's up? Snout. Yes, yeah, hello. Uh, yep. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm an Orthodox Christian as well, but I'm m more interested in the um, early history of the papacy. Where, where do you think the Roman papacy started going wrong? Like if you could put like a rough time period, like when did they start uh, diverging from the Orthodox faith? I think there's the seeds of overarching claims that begin even in the 6th, 7th, 8th century. Um, there's a big leap forward uh, with, you know, what happens after Charlemagne and the issues with what Photius writes about uh in his day, it's starting to really crack. Um, I think that the key, I would agree with the Eastern Catholic and, and Congar uh, that it's really the Gregorian reforms where we really see a revolution. So it's, it's now pretty normative in Roman Catholic scholarship to admit that the Gregorian reforms are, are a revolution in ecclesiology. So I would say that's the probably the clearest period, even according to them. So even even before uh, the uh, the, the filioque into the quit, uh, creed, like with the Gregorian forms, were they like seventh century? Or? No, that's is, this is eleventh uh, oh. century. Uh, okay, okay, I see, I see. That's where so Gregory ref totally revolutionizes the papacy, like with all these grandiose claims. Shortly after, this is when we get the Dictatus Pape, then we get uh, Unum Sanctum, you know. So we get really overreaching, wild papal stuff which couldn't have happened without the Gregorian reforms of uh, the 11th century. And would you, would you say that these uh, innovations emerged on the periphery of what used to be the Western Roman Empire, like in, in Spain and in like Cluny, uh, where they developed these doctrines of papal supremacy and the filioque? I think that the canonical privileges uh, grew and evolved into more and more problematic claims hence the forgeries and the many of the forgeries backing up these claims so the forgeries kind of develop over many centuries as well to bolster the claims uh and that's why they kind of start accruing and piling up so it's just i think it's a centuries-long development of what begins as 
first among equals, canonical privileges like any other metropolitan or protos has, according to the canons, that evolve into more and more grandiose claims that are backed up by more and more forgeries that turn into 11th century uh, Gregorian reforms. And then we get full on unum sanctum that if you if you disagree with the uh, Pope as the God Emperor over all kings, then you're damned. Not just you have to be Roman Catholic to be saved, but you have to believe in the temporal supremacy to be saved. I mean, nobody taught that the temporal supremacy dogma was necessary for salvation. And that's until Unum Sanctum, uh, conceivably, or perhaps the uh, the canons that are their forgeries that eventually state that the first sea is judged by no one. Ubi has a whole documentary on that. That's that a lot of that's based on forgeries as well. And that's still, as I understand, I think that's still in Roman canon law. The first sea is judged by no one. And it has its origins in one of the uh, decree, false decretals, or I forget exactly where it's from, but Ubi's, Ubi's documentaries cover this if you want more on it. Uh, what would you say was, was the primary motivation of uh, whoever forged these documents or whoever made these claims? Well, I don't think anybody knows exactly who forged them or the motive, but I mean, the motivations pretty clearly seem to be to bolster the temporal claims of Rome and then eventually the full universal claims of Rome. And uh, which, which popes started doing this? And for, oh, like, what were the circumstances under which they did this? Again, the circumstances were using the donation of Constantine, the false decretals, uh, the, there's a whole bunch of these, like the whole, there's like 25 different famed forgeries, including forged quotes like in, you know, Aquinas, uh, against the errors of the Greeks. I mean, that's full of like 30% forgeries. So again, this is over several centuries. There's not like one, oh, here's the Pope where this first starts kicking off. I mean, Ubi has a documentary where he covers where it first starts kicking off, if that's what you're looking for. It's called uh, Dec False Decretals, A Road to Schism. Or Papal, papal, uh, papal Forgeries, I've, Road to Schism. Excuse me. I've heard the argument that uh, the reason that uh, the, papacy, the papacy started taking on more temporal power was because uh, the Western Roman Empire collapsed and they didn't have any earthly protector. Yeah, the that's, church, that's so true. To, but yeah, That's yeah. true, but um, that's a violation of the canons. The canons clearly teach that the church is not a temporal state power. And so Rome doesn't care. That's why they had to back it up with forged decretals and all this kind of stuff. So if you go to the documentary called Papal Forgeries, A Road to Schism, it, it covers all these in detail. And, uh, well, as for the spiritual side of it, like the spiritual side of the schism, uh, would you say that uh, the Holy Spirit was still present in the Roman Catholic Church even after 1054? Yeah, that's why I think that uh, the dogmatic statement of the double eternal hypostatic procession is uh, 1274 at Lyons. So if we want to date the official dogmatic pronouncement, it's 1274, and that's why the East has the Palamite synods as a response to Lyons to reject it. Well, would you agree with uh, the metaphor of how, you know, if a branch gets cut off from a tree, you know, it still has life in its leaves for a little while afterwards before it dies? Yeah, I don't think that everybody in the West uh, automatically knew what the Council of Lyons said and automatically was trying to be heterodox. But I think that eventually you notice that Rome continues to evolve in that direction with more and more absurdities and innovations and, uh, you know, all the way up to where we are now with Vatican II. So I'm not going to judge history in some arbitrary way like it's a blackout at 1274. I'm sure there's nuance and I, I have, you know, I hope that everybody in the West you know, I hope it's as late as possible for all those people for when they're cut off. Yeah, well, I guess like when you get into like the murkiness of, um, of history, things get a little bit more ambiguous. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's any 
like, oh, we all know that in 1274 it was a blackout. I don't, I don't think it works like that. Just like it wasn't a blackout in 1054, because not everybody in the West was automatically believing all of the Latin doctrines. It took it took a long time for the Latin errors to filter down to all the lay people is what I'm trying to say. So I think we should be, uh, you know, we should grant people as much grace as possible. Absolutely. It's Joe time. What's up, man? Got to unmute. Right, guys, if you can't unmute, I mean, I don't, I, how many times do I have to tell you? Sorry. Dimitri, what's up? Dimitri dropped out. J Boogie, what's up? J Boog. I'm you. Hey, how's it going, Jay? What's up? Yeah, I just wanted to engage with you on Protestant Sorceriology, if you were willing to. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to see what the issue was with the um, doctrine of imputation, seeing it is clearly taught throughout the Epistle of Romans. And I would be happy to walk you through it if you have time. Well, the Protestant view of what's imputed, could, can you can you hold on a second? The kids in the background. So the Protestant view of imputation trades on it being primarily something that's nominalistic, that's based on the nominalist view of what these terms mean and signify. So if you beam by imputation an actual power, that's the orthodox view, not a pure legal standing. So you could never have the Protestant view of Luther and Calvin had we not had Gabriel Bile and medieval nominalism first. So all of your readings are going to presuppose that division between name and reality or the purely nominalistic view that underlies Luther and Calvin's doctrine of purely legal imputation well one, one sec because in romans it says that um, faith was imputed to abraham as righteousness the same way that it is imputed to us sure and if you go back to genesis when was that faith uh, cr uh righteousness credited to abraham yeah it it's not genesis 12 right when he when he believed god hold on and he was cre and he was credited righteousness you're you're not so you didn't have to be we have to are be you precise. listening can you hear me yeah go ahead so you what did i just say i said that how you interpret the imputation and what it refers to will be dependent on your presupposition so you're assuming that it's a purely legal standard so imputation means you're going to do work the ancient future. hold on so in genesis 12 that if you're a protestant that should be his transition from wrath to grace but when Paul says that in Romans, no, it's not. Paul doesn't quote Genesis 12. He quotes Genesis 15 after he'd done three chapters of good works. So the very citation refutes you. No, but, but what, what you're failing to realize, and this is why we have to be specific with our terminology. Imputation, if you read the Epistle of Romans, it's always talking about uh, imputation, a righteousness that is foreign to the 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 receiver. Yeah, I believe that. So for, for example, it does it. You don't have it in yourself. It well, comes well, from on, God. It's it's the uncreated energy you, that comes from God. It's foreign to you. There there is no uncreated energy in the Bible. Paul says in First Corinthians twelve that the uncreated energia of the Spirit are what he doles out as his gifts, and he says in Thessalonians that. The inner Gaia are at work in him as well as in Philippians. So it's in the Greek text. It's actually the uncreated energies. Right, right. But I, I don't want to run from Romans 4. You just said there's no energies in Scripture. It, yeah, uh, the, the, the phrase uncreated energy. We, this is I, I just told you the, uh, the uncreated inner Gaia. Start making things up. The uncreated, things in that's in Paul's letters, the, the inner Gaia. I just cited Paul's letters to you. I'm not making anything up. Okay, can you show me the exact phrase, uncreated energies in the Bible? The inner Gaia of the Spirit. Do you think the Spirit's a creature? No. So what are the so energies? What? So you don't even know that in Paul's epistles, it's energies. I'm not talking about the energy. You see, this is what I mean by... You just said uh, there's no energies Catholics in Scripture. You just, they you just said... from Romans 4. Romans 4 cites Genesis 15, not Genesis 12. So there's 
three chapters of Abraham doing good works, which you just ignored. So both of these points, you're wrong. Well, hang on, hang on. This is why I want to pin you down on this because this you're is not pinning clear. down anything when you just said that the energies aren't in Paul's. Well, well, are the are the energies? Don't repeat my name. Are the energies in Paul's epistles or not? The word energy is is besides the point of imputation. No, this is what you, I mean by you're running. You just I'm not running. I just addressed Romans four that it cites Genesis fifteen. Well, let me quote the passage. And then does it cite Genesis? Does it cite Genesis fifteen? That's because, in your view, it should have been Genesis 12 that was cited because that would be the transition from wrath to grace. Well, here's, here's the hammer to the nail. Here's the point I'm going to drive. You're not, uh, so everything I say, you don't, you ignore. Everything I'm oh, saying. No, I, heard, I heard what you said. You said so the energies crazy. don't exist in scripture. They do. And you say, it doesn't I matter. I never read the word uncreated energy anywhere in my That's English. because Maybe it's in the, it's Greek, in the Greek, dude. The Greek. Paul's epistles okay, use energeia. Are, are you Greek? Okay, this is utterly stupid. Okay. What does me having to be Greek have to do with this? Uh, that's the dumbest process I've ever had on here. Jose Mendoza, what's up? Unbelievable. Jose, I'm mute. Or don't. Hello, hello. Joe. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, three quick questions for you, Jay. Um, I've been following you for a long time, um, specifically the issue of salvation outside the Orthodox Church. So uh, I'm sure you're rather familiar with the uh, icon, essentially the ark and the water, on land the Antichrist, ecumenists, Luther, things like that, right? Um, I, I did see a video uh, from a YouTube channel called Ready to Harvest. It's a little academic. Uh, he was quoting... Um, Archbishop Filaret of New York, uh, where he says, uh, in contradistinction to that point, that Protestants can have salvation, Catholics can have salvation, uh, but he further goes on to say that those who are born within the Orthodox Church and leave it for other denominations do lose their salvation. Uh, have you heard or read anything to that effect? And furthermore, is that binding on the church or not necessarily, you know, the opinions of one archbishop? Yeah, I mean, the opinions of one person don't really mean anything. I mean, I think we should respect people that are authorities in the church, but it really doesn't have anything to do with whether that's the case. So if he's talking about people who are united to the church in a uh, God knows only how way, that's in spite of Protestantism. Protestantism doesn't save anybody. So everybody has to be united to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, to the mystical body. Okay. And yeah, and that's God's and God's alone. That's like, you know, essentially the secret will of God. That's not something that we can discern. Correct. Uh, nor are we to. Um, so then what do we make of, uh, for example, St. John Chrysostom, who died excommunicated from the church? Right. I'm sorry, I was looking up something on Blue Letter Bible. I'm trying to get the, the inner Gaius references up. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it again. Yeah, so, uh, it, I mean, why would that, so the... the the church can locals councils and bishops can uh persecute the righteous in many cases so the, the john chrysostom was not outside the church so it's like it sounds like a roman catholic view like it's not it's not some papal view that it's uh automatically that way well again i, I could be wrong but from my understanding he did die did you not hear what I said? Church excommunicated. I don't know if they So do you? So again, the I mean, Saint uh, Maximus was persecuted as well. So, do, the, 
there can be unjust excommunications. How does that have anything to do with what we're talking about? Sure, and then, right. Uh, uh, third and final point. I saw your video on essentially the common atheist objection, which is essentially some form of Marcionism where they say, you know what, the God of the Old Testament is far too different from the God of the New Testament, so throw it all out, right? And if anything, I see that relatively emerge within evangelical circles especially. Um, do you have any books on the topic, uh, essentially the nature of God in the Old Testament uh, and in the New Testament um, that you would recommend? On what? Uh, essentially, uh, the argument that I hear commonly is the God of the Old Testament is far too different from the God of the New Testament. Yeah, I did a whole three-hour live stream on it. Oh, really? What's the name of that one? I, I had not seen that one. Old Testament, New Testament, Contradictions. Um, yeah, so that's uh, Marcionism, basically, right? So just find that three that three-hour talk that I did. So, yeah, I wasn't trying to be rude to you. So here we go in terms of this Protestant person. I was immersed in looking up the uh, references in the New Testament to Energeia. To know what is the exceeding greatness of his inner gaia or power towards us who believe according to the working, the operation or energy of his power. I was made a minister according to the effectual energy of his power. From this is joined together every effectual inner gaia, energy, Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians, that I might be fashioned according to the energy of his body his resurrected body, Philippians 3, whereunto I labor, striving according to the energy by which he works in me. Paul says the energy of God works in me. There's no such thing as created energies, therefore it's uncreated energies. Buried with him in, in baptism to be risen through the faith in the energy of God, Colossians 2.12. Even him who is coming is after the energy of Satan. So angels also have a created energy that is proper to them. So there you go. Inner Gaia, operation, work. Multiple uses in the New Testament. It's also used for the working or the power, the gifting of 1 Corinthians of the Holy Spirit. So literally no idea what he's talking about. The Bible does not talk about uncreated energies and so it's something that you have made up. Made up? Like all of those verses? And I hope everybody caught the point that I was making about Romans. Because this is a really simple... I knew he was going to fall into this mistake, too. Because I know what it's like to be a Protestant. <laughs> I used to believe in the doctrine of imputation. So let's go to Romans 4, where it talks about Abraham being justified. And let's note, let's look and see where it talks about this occurring. Being fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to perform... And therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. Okay. But where does Paul cite? He doesn't cite Genesis 12. Now, why does this matter? Because in the Roman, or excuse me, in the uh, Protestant doctrine of justification, Abraham first believes and is the friend of God in Genesis 12. Right? So we have 12. 13, 14, 15. We have three chapters of Abraham believing and doing good works before the section that Paul cites in Genesis 15. Now, if Paul believed in justification by faith alone and he was a good Calvinist Protestant or classical Protestant, then he would have knowingly cited Genesis 12 as the transition from wrath to grace. Okay, if you're a Protestant, classical Protestant, you should know what the transition from wrath to grace is. This is a very strict doctrine. So either Paul messed up by citing Genesis 15, or Paul doesn't teach your dumb doctrine. Very simple argument. Hopefully people can follow that. Orange raft. Hey, Jay. Yep. Hey, so I've got a question uh, somewhat related to geopolitics and also biblical interpretation. Okay. And uh, anyways, I'm reading Invoking the Beyond, 
and I'm on like page 1050 so it's getting down to the wire but the Collins brothers um, they talk about the Nephilim doctrine in Genesis 6 in their chapter on aliens mm-hmm. yeah I've read that part yeah so they they seem to take the Sethite view on that do- on uh, Genesis 6 mm-hmm. but I was just wondering what also the church fathers you cut out you weren't run, wondering what oh i was wondering um what your position on the genesis fix doctrine is um whether you would maybe take the collins brothers view or the view that they seem to be somewhat combative towards uh no i tend to favor the uh view that Genesis 6 is talking about fallen angelic beings because of the many passages in the Deuterocanon that cite it to precisely be giants and titans. So I don't think that this makes you a heretic or something like that. I mean, I think that there's quite a bit of divergence amongst the church fathers. The earliest church fathers, the first three centuries, tend to uh, view it as angels. And then after Augustine, you get the normativity of the the view that it's seth or the the mighty men of old so i mean i think that be either of these views is possible but i mean the book of jude does cite the book of enoch so to me that suggests that the 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 traditional classic biblical and early early patristic era believed in angels um but one of the reasons that the collins brothers are critiquing that is that a lot of the alien and ufo cults utilize this uh doctrine of uh, bloodline baloney to promote their various alien mythologies and so obviously i believe that stuff is all uh, absurd and gnostic so i would agree with their criticism but um, i don't believe that the texts are describing merely uh, powerful ancient leaders like nimrod i think it's it literally is talking about angels okay cool um yeah thank you for that um the uh no, and I, I, I agree with most of what the Collins brothers are saying in this book. I mean, it's a, it's really good. Um, I wanted to also know what your thoughts were on um, Michael Heiser's view. I don't know if you know him that much, but he ties... Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar the, with all of his stuff, yeah. Okay, cool. So I, was, I read his book uh, prior to Finding Orthodoxy, and now... My wife and I are uh, catechumens, and um, anyways, we. Yes, I think the the divine divine council. The Nephilim doctrine to the conquest of Joshua, and that basically there's no way to interpret the conquest of Joshua outside of the fallen angel um, interpretation. So I also wanted to know what your thoughts were on that, or if there is any other coherent view outside of that. No, I think that's plausible. I think that does make sense. I mean, I've, I've cited that before um, as part of the reason why Cana was, was cleansed. Okay. I, okay. Think that the, I think there's texts in the Old Testament that are speaking that way. Yeah. And so if we read it just as mighty men of old, and uh, you know, I think it, it reduces the force of those passages. It doesn't really make sense. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Anyways, cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your thoughts. That was yeah, fun. good questions. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that I hadn't thought about in a long time, but I, but yes, I am familiar with what you're talking about. Um, and I know that Michael Heiser was a subscriber to my site for many years uh, before he passed away. BVM, what's up? Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Hey, Jay. So uh, first off, I wanted to say, Thank you for helping me to convert to orthodoxy. Uh, you, Father Deacon, and uh, David Erhan were some of the people that really helped me to learn about the Orthodox Church. And um, I converted from Roman Catholicism. And uh, my question is not really a, a major one. I wanted to know what you think about... Um, so in terms of the Council of Florence... Uh, I already think that the Florentine Council refutes Roman Catholicism because it teaches the, you know, they wouldn't say double hypostatic procession, but, you know, it it teaches the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, which is then later contradicted by uh, John Paul II's filioque clarification. So I already think 
it refutes Roman Catholicism, but I was just thinking through the, another reason that it does refute it, which is uh, if you uh, it like uh, it, the quote would be Denzinger seven fourteen. If you're looking in that, which by the way, that's another thing. As a Roman Catholic, I already had that book. I was a trad, and the fact that you had that book when I came across your content, I was like, oh man, this guy really knows what he's talking about. Anyways, um, I was curious what you think about uh, where it says, you know, that uh, not only pagans, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics uh, cannot become participants in eternal life. And then, of course, it goes on to say that even if someone has shed blood for the name of Christ, they can't be saved unless they've remained in the bosom of the Catholic Church. Yeah, um, Cantare Domino. Like Roman Catholic apologists make the point that uh well this really only means schismatic in the canonical sense and so it's not contradicted by later vatican ii uh teaching and i was just curious what you think about that if if that's a good critique okay, but the, it, do, it doesn't it doesn't it just or, say schismatics it says all heretics pagans obviously a pagan is not in the church and having left the church it's talking about everyone outside the pale of the visible roman catholic structure right yeah i guess i've just i've heard you know carbohydrate lofton and other people say like oh well when this says schismatic it really means just the bishops who were actively like denying the orthodox or sorry denying well, the but it, the the pope hold on the the text is not restricted to schismatic so what does it have to do with no you're you're right no i guess i'm saying like uh they would use it as a as an as an apologetic to i, I okay i see what you're saying you're saying that apologetic for how, what is it how does this help them in any way i don't understand the argument right no i see what you're saying because we can we can even if it helps them with orthodoxy, it doesn't help them with the pagans and the Nostra Tate yeah. statement about sure. Hindus contemplating the divine mystery. So, yeah, okay. I well, let's just point. make it really simple. Um, Vatic Post-Vatican II, the Roman Catholic Church no longer believes that the doctrine of the temporal supremacy of the Roman bishop is necessary. Unum Sanctum, <laughs> Unum Sanctum right. says that to be saved, you have to believe in it. So how can the requirements for salvation change from the time of Unum Sanctum to post-Vatican II. Yeah. No, that's a good point, to not restrict it to just this document and try to squint our... Well, then this is what they do. They squint their eyes at this, and they try to say, well, how do we fit this with this? And then they pick another document and, and try to figure out how they can sort of fit a round peg into a square hole. So... Uh, well, no, when, you were a, when you were a trad cat... How would you have responded to the fact that Unum Sanctum says that the temporal authority of the Roman bishop is necessary for salvation? And Vatican II, post Vatican II, the documents clearly say that you know it favors the de Catholicizing of, of uh, many Roman Catholic countries and clearly does not teach the temporal uh, power and authority of the Roman bishop anymore. Well, the funny thing is, uh, what I would say is that. Vatican II is not dogmatic because before I came across your content and learned a little bit more about Roman Catholic theology, I thought that whether or not something is dogmatic actually mattered, but it really doesn't because people are also bound to the ordinary teaching of the magisterium. Right, so. and also being a heretic in the Roman Catholic system is not premised on the authority behind your heresy. Right, exactly. Yeah, I've heard you make this point before, and it, it's a great well, point. Because they will like, always say, yeah. it's not binding, it's not ex-cathedra. So, what does that have to do with whether it's heresy or not? Right, because if, if, if they're going to provide unity and clarity with the papacy, but the papacy will bind people, even if not infallibly, if it will bind people to contradictory things, how is that good for the church? Well, I mean, the, doc, the teaching of Vatican I is that the Roman See cannot teach error. So... And that means in any moral uh, or dogmatic capacity. So it doesn't matter the status of the document. Francis can't teach error. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And if he does teach error on faith and morals, 
then this calls into question the Vatican One view. And they always want to deflect into the different criteria, the status of the document. So I know. So in other words, think how silly this is. So Francis could, or let's say Benedict, somebody that they really like. So Benedict could write a book denying the Trinity, but because he didn't write it as an encyclical or something uh, promulgated to the entire church, it doesn't count because he didn't bind anybody to it. So he's not a heretic because he didn't bind anybody to it. It doesn't count. This is so ridiculous. L Martin Luther didn't couldn't bind anyone to his views, and yet he gets uh, Serge Domine or what's the I forget the the, the encyclical that uh, excommunicates uh, Luther. It's not Serge Domine or maybe it is. I forget. By the way, here's that text in First Corinthians uh, for those that are wondering. Diversity of gifts, same spirit, di di differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of energies or activities. That's again making the point about the energies in the New Testament, which the Protestants said, there are no energies in the New Testament. You made it up. Uh, no, dude, I didn't make it up. But um, what's the, what's Roman, what, what's Luther's uh, excommunication document called? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. The bull uh, that excommunicates Luther. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine. Right. The, yeah. Your your point still stands, though, is is he was excommunicated not because he was the pope who has the authority allegedly to bind the faithful, but because he taught heresy. Exactly. Exactly. Exerge Domine. I'm right. That's the bull that excommunicates Luther. Exerge Domine. Uh, and just think how silly this is. So so on that idea of many trads and others that want to excuse all the teachings of error of uh, the last 70 years or whatever their whole argument is just that well it doesn't count because it's not i'm not bound by those errors what does that have to do with whether it's heresy or not absolutely nothing none none whatsoever that's why the roman catholic church for example for many years condemned propositions denzinger is full of quote condemned propositions the yes. reason that it's a condemned proposition is that it helps you identify, if you're a faithful Roman Catholic, post-Tridentine Catholic, you can identify that is a condemned proposition. If you promote that, you are a heretic, you see. So it's not required that, I mean, so in this view, a layman could never be a heretic. How silly is this? There have been countless laymen that were heretics. Right. But a layman yeah, can't and, bind anybody to their teaching. Yeah. Um, I would just want to make one more point that you've helped to clarify for me, and then I'll jump off. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, another thing that I think is just devastating to the position of, uh, you know, the epistemic certitude that they think they have is who can tell you whether it's the magisterium of Michael Lofton or the magisterium of Taylor Marshall who can tell you how to weigh which documents and which statements have which level of authority in terms of, you know, because obviously they contradict whether it's infallibly contradict or not. They contradict, but who can tell you which which documents to to follow? And and that and thus it, it turns into Protestantism where yep. you have 50 different kinds of Roman Catholics. Exactly. Bingo. You win the you win today's uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean how many times have we said that uh, the whole point of the Roman Catholic magisterial system is that the magisterium is the final word, it's the final word. If it's the final word, why do we need the interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation of the final word? Why do we need why do we need Taylor Marshall and Michael Lofton and Trent Horn and why do we need all of these apologists explaining all of the documents to us if the magisterium is the final word? We don't need these people. We're supposed to be able to go to the Oracle of Rome, right? And yet the whole system operates exactly as you said, like a form of Protestantism, but it's Protestantism not with the Bible, but with papal documents. Which is even more confusing. It is more confusing. It's a lot more work, right? I mean, at least in Protestantism, I have like a fixed body of books, right, and documents. Okay, I've got this one. Let me work through this. Now you got all these mountains of papal stuff you got to work through, and it's like, oh, come on. And yeah, so again, this key point, which is that, remember, the Roman Catholic system doesn't actually give you uh, an, an infallible list of dogmas. 
there is no infallible list of the dogmas, which by the way, why wouldn't Rome do that? Wouldn't Rome make it really easy and just give the infallible list of the infallible dogmas? Why doesn't Francis or Benedict or whoever, why didn't they just say, I'm speaking from the chair. This is going to help everybody in the church. It'll make a, for a lot of unity and clarity. Here is the infallible list of the infallible dogmas. Well, there's not that. What is there? There is criteria categories by which you can classify the documents and the sections of the documents as you read and interpret them. So you're in no better position than the Protestant. You see, it's a bait and switch. It's a car salesman game. Aha, look at all the chaos of Protestantism. Let me sell you the papacy, which will, hey, yo, sir, come on, let's step right up. Let me get you one papacy right here. Look at you. So it's like, a, it's like a carnival barker man selling you a papacy thing that turns out, oh, no, it's actually just mountains of other documents that you have a, a, a general criteria that hopefully you can put them in the right bins. Right. Which exactly. And the, the criteria you mentioned, OK, we have criteria for putting them in the bins, but no one can even agree. None of the Roman Catholics can agree on how to interpret those criteria and yep. what the criteria even are. They don't even agree on how many ex cathedra statements there are. It's oh, man, it's crazy. But uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to let you go. But I do want to say one more thing. Sure. I noticed I was watching this on YouTube and also engaging in this on Twitter spaces and your hair looks vastly different. So I wanted to ask you, like, are you like trying to grow a ponytail or something? Or what's going on with that? I'm transitioning out of my Nicolas Cage phase into my Matthew McConaughey phase. Nice. <laughs> so yes, okay, it, well, it will, it will, time, absolutely. It. it will be, uh, it will surpass McConaughey eventually. Uh, Jim, what's up, Jim? You notice the document here condemning Luther, uh, 1520 of Pope Leo X, Exerti Dominant. Does it say anything about Luther's status in the authority structure of Rome? Does his authority status and the authority that he put behind the 95 Theses, does it have anything to do with his teaching, his heresies, or his excommunication? No. His, his authority in the structure has zero to do with whether he's a heretic or not. Therefore, Roman Catholics is a really simple point. When are you going to give up the deflection that it doesn't matter if Francis and the Vatican II people teach a thousand heresies, I'm not bound to it because it's not authoritative or binding. What does that have to do with whether it's objectively heresy or not? Now, the other option for the Roman Catholics to say, well, Maybe it is, but it's all material heresy and not formal heresy. And the ridiculousness of this is just that, okay, so you're telling me that the papacy of the last 70 years, we'll t take the typical trad who says that, well, the popes and the magisterium are, are uh, in material heresy, but not formal heresy, because we don't know uh, if... It, we don't know if John Paul and, and Benedict and, uh, and Francis, if they actually know they're in error. Okay, so the pope, doesn't know Roman Catholicism. Rome, which cannot teach error according to Vatican I, now we're saying, for 70 years has not known basic Catholicism. I mean, think how ridiculous this is, especially given Vatican I. There's no place in Vatican I for 70 years of magisterium being clueless about the foundational teachings of Catholicism. I mean, this is just crazy talk. Did you want to say something? It's uh, just unmute. Jim, I'm you or not. Okay. Uh, Tim page. Do you want to say something? Uh, hello. Yes, sir. What's up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Hey, how you doing, Jim? Good. What's up, dude? All right, I guess there's a delay because I don't hear anything. Jim, you want to try again? What's up, Jim? By the way, guys, if you want to support through Super Chats, Super Chat functions are via Streamlabs. 
What's up, Jim? My mic is on now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. What's up? Can you talk a little bit about, I feel like Protestants don't want to debate Orthodox because if you go straight to St. Augustine and you talk about how the different, the nuanced differences between original sin and ancestral sin, which they don't want to acknowledge, it totally destroys everything, the foundation, the foundation of everything, because, you know, you get stupid doctrines like immaculate conception, uh, purgatory, you know, and if, 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 if that premise is destroyed, either the whole reformed thing is stupid. And, uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And are you, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Is this Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've done many live streams covering uh, Augustinian theology and the difficulties there. Here's one of them. It's a really important, about a three-hour live stream. Uh, Augustine, Calvin, Original Sin, and Orthodox Theology. So if anybody's interested in that topic, I highly recommend that really detailed, uh, long lecture that we did there. It's it's uh, three hours and 14 minutes, and it's actually making the very points that you're making, Jim. Exactly. And and the, the reason I did that lecture was precisely because of what you're saying, that if, if we can show the um, impossibilities in the Augustinian view of anthropology, Trinitarian theology, and Christology, then by default, Calvinism's out of here. You know, I... Uh... Another thing that I find kind of amusing is uh, if you uh, see these, you know, current uh, hyper Calvinist pastors like John MacArthur, Doug Wilson, uh, James White, and you li- or R.C. Sproul, you know, you listen to these guys and like, you know, they talk about predestination. Oh, I like, listened to them for many, many years, my friend. I uh, know, and they talk about like, you know, Jesus only could receive the elect that the the Father gave them, right? They're big on saying that. Yet these reformers were so clever, they forgot about the filioque way. Well, how is the Holy Spirit only going to descend to the elect from the Father if there's a double procession coming down from both Christ? You know what I mean? It, the mm. logic is, like, mm-hmm. bizarre. They're, like, so, like, their logic is, I feel like you don't need a degree, a uh, PhD in, uh, you know, engineering to figure that one out, you know? Yeah, I think the biggest, uh, the easiest way to, and, and unfortunately this does kind of require, uh, I, I mean, Calvinism is probably the most of the intellectual of the Protestant movements. I mean, there are some intellectual Lutherans and Anglicans, sure. And a lot of the Anglicans are also, you know, quasi influenced by Calvin. But I mean, aside from those, um, you know, scholastic and uh, classical Reformation traditions, I mean, there's really nobody else is really that interested in the deep theology, per se, and the historical theology. So the easiest way to refute this stuff is to get into Christology. Uh, And I realized that after I read the, you know, Christology uh, book of St. Cyril. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of John McGuckin, but his book on Cyril is good because it, it it ends up refuting Calvinism. It really makes Calvinism into Nestorianism. And if you can get that point down, pretty much all the rest of this goes out the window. And I would say too, for those that are interested, I do have uh, two lengthy uh, refutations of Reformed theology. One of them you'll see right there, which is uh, on Cotel's channel there, Orthodox Deconstruction of Reformed Theology from a couple years ago. And then there's the uh, three-hour uh, critique of James White and evangelicalism there. And there's also really in-depth critique of Calvinism over on Sam Shamoon's channel that I did uh, a few years ago as well. So any more questions on that, Jim? No, no. I'll, I won't bore the audience with any more of those. No, that's no those are great points. We all, th- it's good to bring those back up because a lot of people you know, they're coming around maybe and they're new to these topics or to the channel. They've not seen, you know, the zillionth, uh, I'm not complaining. It's good to do this. They haven't seen the zillionth, uh, you know, critique that we did 10 years or five years ago of this stuff, three years ago of this stuff. Tim Page, you want to try again? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. What's up? How are you doing, Jay? Good, man. How are you? Yeah. Oh, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I'm glad to be on your show. You're my favorite podcaster. Thank you. Um, but yeah, um, I'm coming to you from the Catholic position. Um, I come a convert to Catholicism from Protestantism. Uh, uh, but a lot of my question towards you, I guess, a challenge. I'm open-minded. You know what I mean? Okay. 
I'm sure. not an academic or anything like that. When I was Protestant, I was really into Calvinism and stuff like that. And because Protestant is just Bible-based, it's easy to think you know a lot when you're Protestant. Mm-hmm. But when you have the historical churches and stuff like that, uh, there's so much that I yeah, don't know. But well, hey, I, 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 I feel you. A I lot bit. of the paradigm that I'm coming from is when it was all one before the East-West schism, I guess, and I don't, I'm not, I don't know my history like tons. I, I guess it's a basic understanding, but they kind of d- were divided, but the East, they still recognized the Pope was, the Bishop of Rome was supreme. I think they called it the first among equals, right? They had an understanding, but I guess yeah, sure. there was some disagreements or whatever like that. And the East said, well, that's just in name. Like we say that, but it's not really practice. And is why they totally divided and so i guess my question or whatever uh i don't know if you have an answer for it but it seems like all the church from the beginning or at least earliest history like they did recognize the bishop of rome sure what about what it was in name and not practice they didn't agree how it was carried out well, I mean, you can look at Canon Six of Nicaea and see how, uh, you know, in that time, clearly Rome had uh, a first among equals position. But if you look at the recent two documents from the uh, Roman Theological Commissions with the Orthodox, the Chieti doc, the Chieti document, and the Alexandria document that just came out, which we just covered, you'll notice that uh, the Chieti document admits that the jurisdiction of the Roman bishop was still uh, limited. It was not universal. And uh, we can look at the apostolic canons that we cover in that live stream. And you can look at Canon 6 of Nicaea, as well as actually canons in every one of the ecumenical councils presuppose and enact the position and are based on the position that Rome is not universal in its jurisdiction. Even the notion of the appeal system, uh, as the Chieti, Chieti and Alexandria documents admit, was not something that was just an appeal to the final authority in Rome. It was an appeal system that could appeal anywhere. And it was a, an appeal system for a retrial, mm-hmm. not, not for a final word from, from the Pope. Okay. Because, yeah, I guess, you know, the big problem or whatever I have in my mind, you know, I'm open to all this kind of stuff. I'm open to learn. But I guess my understanding is, like Jesus, he said to Peter, you are the rock on which... I will build my church. And yeah, but he says that, that as the bishop of Rome, and uh, so like a lot of the stuff you've been talking about. Like I've been listening, I've been listening to your shows for a while, but I've been listening. You had the father on, and I guess another Orthodox guy, and a lot of it really spoke to me and kind of piqued my interest. You know? Yeah. Um, sure. So but, the first, so first thing I would say is that Matthew sixteen. Jesus says the same thing when it comes to uh, keys and authority and jurisdiction two chapters later to the rest of the College of the Apostles. So where is the idea that this comes to... G- for, so the Roman Catholic view is that Jesus gives this to Peter, then Peter uh, is the source of that for everyone else. But why would we think that when he breathes on all the apostles, when the Holy Spirit descends on all of them, right? Does the Holy Spirit descend on Peter and then to the rest of the apostles? It's always a, coll- a collegial situation. So how does that square with so many historical examples of this not playing out the way that Vatican I words it? And you'll notice Vatican I, Pastor Eternus, it words it like this was always the understanding of the church. And yet so many of, the, so many of Roman Catholic apologists, as well as the two new documents, the, the Chieti document and the uh, Alexandria document, they, adm- they admit that it was a development. It can't be both. It can't be the ancient always ever understood view of the church that the roman bishop had universal supremacy and jurisdiction and so forth and also it wasn't the case that was always understood and it developed those are mutually exclusive claims okay um yeah i guess i'd have to learn about this kind of stuff well we did a live stream i guess my thinking is when the split happened it was they all believed kind of the bishop you know, he was kind of the successor of Peter, but I guess the disagreement was of how much authority they actually have, and I guess they became so separated, the Eastern people didn't like what 
the Bishop of Rome had to say. And and well, I would say uh, if you if you want to see where like the I said, it's bigger with tradition. Okay. So there's a delay here. I'm gonna I'm not trying to be rude, but um, it's gonna take forever okay. if we don't. So. Uh, we, we just did a live stream, uh, on this very topic, uh, two days ago. So go watch the live stream, Roman Catholicism admits Orthodox positions again, David Erhan and Snack, where we just covered the, uh, new Alexandria document. So for those that don't know, this is a papally approved document. Both documents are linked. You can go get them. Everyone's where's the documents? Where's the doc? They're linked right here. And we'll link them again for you. There you go. Actually, I can't link it because it's too long. Uh, but you can go get, get the link underneath that show. It's in the show description. There's the document. Synodality and primacy in the second millennium and today. Now, the other document is also full of admissions. And this, again, the papacy is approving these. Well, I don't care what the papacy does. I don't got to listen to him. Yeah, I'm pretty sure in the Roman Catholic system, you do have to listen to him. And so if he approves documents that admit all of our positions, then that's pretty, pretty good for us, I would say. So the first document, synodality and primacy in the first millennium, Chiedi, 21st of September, 2016. And the new document is Alexandria, June 7th, 2023, synodality and primacy in the second millennium. So you see these first millennium, second millennium, these admit, I would say 90% of Orthodox criticisms and points. And so, quite simply, if this is admitting all of our points, then we were correct. And I'm sorry, Vatican I is not going to work. So, to understand this issue, for people that want to understand it, you're going to have to do a little reading. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's, it's not all easy. But you're going to go to this site because it's actually got the full statement. Papalencyclicals.net. And you're going to pull up decrees of the First Vatican Council. You're going to want to print this out. It's about 15 pages. I'm sorry that you might have to read 15 pages. I know that's impossible for some people. They're just, they can't, they're not going to do it. So turn off your TikTok and your Twitter and print out decrees of the First Vatican Council right here. Then I want you to print out this document, which is also not that long. Synodality. And then I want you to print out this document which is also not very long. So all together, this is probably going to be about 35 pages. Well, guess what? You're going to have a really good up-to-date understanding of the issues if you read these three things. You don't even have to go into a bunch of Vatican II documents because the Chiedi and Alexandria documents will, will cite Vatican II positions for you. So you don't have to go read 800 pages of Vatican II over here. These documents will summarize it pretty well, again, admitting our positions. I'm talking about Chiedi, Chiedi and Alexandria, okay? But is, the, is that consistent with the dogma presented in Vatican I? And I argue, no, it is not. Not at all. Now, that's just, that's just focusing on the issues of Vatican I and the Orthodox stuff. That's not focusing on the issues of pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II teaching, particularly trad cat debates, right? And that's important to this because it's another element of demonstrating Roman Catholic contradictions, okay? The pre-Vatican II teaching and the post-Vatican II teaching. The easiest way to go about that, if you want to, is going to be one single book. After you've read these things that I'm talking about here, you're going to get this book from Tan Books. Very famous, very popular. It's called Popes Against the Modern Errors. And all this is, is 16 papal documents condemning modernism in pretty much every form. And all of these, look at this, there's even a PDF. Look at that. I don't know why, why does Tan sell the book and then give you a free PDF? Well, I'll put it in there in the chat for here's the free PDF of the book. Popes Against the Modern Errors. So what are we going to find in this book? Oh, well, it's going to be the recent papal documents, the last the 16 of them, that condemn modernism in all of its forms. Quote, modern errors. Mirari Voss of Pope Gregory the 16th. 
Quanta Cura of Pius IX, the Syllabus of Errors of Pius IX, Diaturnium Iliud, Illud by Pope Leo XIII. And by the way, I've read all of these. I've read all Leo XIII's encyclicals. I've read this book many years ago as a trad. I know all these. I've read all this stuff. Freemasonry and Naturalism by Leo XIII, Humanum Janus. On the Nature of Liberty, Libertas Prestantissimum by Leo XIII. On the Conditions of the Working Class, Rerum Novarum of Leo XIII. Christian Democracy by Leo XIII. Syllabus of Errors, or Lamentabili San of Pius X. Pacendi Dominici Gracious, Pius X. On the Ceylon Movement, this is like the worker socialist type stuff. Condemned. The Oath Against Modernism that Pius X mandated. And Quas Primus, instituting the Feast of Christ the King, which is directly against the notions of uh, de-Catholicizing states and that Catholicism should not be the state religion and that Christ does not have authority in the temporal sphere. That's what the Feast of Christ the King was initiated to come back, Quas Primus, you see. And what does Vatican do, II do? Well, it denies specifically Quas Primus, exactly. Uh, on fostering true religious unity, Mortalium Animos of 1928 of Pius XI, which specifically and clearly states that interfaith religious gatherings and worship services are a surrendering of the Catholic faith, a.k.a. apostasy. That is one of the clearest exemplifi exemplifications that, that there's a total contradiction. Everybody ought to absolutely know Mortalium Animos very well. On communism, atheists of communism, Pius the ninth, or excuse me, eleventh, Divini Redemptoris, Humani Generis of Pius the twelfth, which allows, by the way, for theistic evolution. So, uh, if you read Popes Against the Modern Errors by Tan, you will be sufficiently uh, alerted to the problems, and then you need to read the decrees of Vatican One because you're going to notice that the structure and the continuity that Vatican One sets up does not allow for a gigantic ecumenical council at, with papal approval for the entire church on faith and morals and its theology being taught for 70 years to even occur and be in error. You cannot have a giant false council with 70 years of pope, pope papal approval given the theology of Vatican I. All you got to do is go read Vatican I. And 95% of trads and roman catholics actually i just haven't read vatican one now a lot of them a lot of the trads they'll read popes against the modern errors okay pretty much when i was in the sspx circles and the trad circles pretty much everybody had a good sense of this right everybody i knew at the sspx chapel right most of us had read or familiar with this book and many of us were good at citing and quoting the different papal encyclicals because this was the authority for us right Okay, so if all of these things are condemned heresies in 16 papal documents, really important, crucial papal documents of the last 300 years, then how do we get the multi-faith Abu Dhabi center, Nostra Atate, and all this gibberish nonsense? So, there you go. Mortalium Animos, night and day, contradicts not just... Uh, Nostra Aetate and Vatican II's uh, modus operandi, but the actions of the papacy the last several decades too. So it's not just a matter of abstract theology. It's the actions of the papacy as well. With Assisi praying with the pagan religions in some giant joint pagan ceremony. And yes, I don't care if there's patriarchs present. They're just as her heretical as Francis doing it. Right? The Roman Catholics, well, what about you? What about, what about, what about? I don't have everything banking on one dude. You do. A la Vatican I. <laughs> so your system is built on one guy not defecting in Rome. Our system is not built on any one guy. There have been many heterodox patriarchs of Constantinople. You ever heard of Nestorius? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If my system was built on one dude then the low IQ, low tier, whataboutism might be a good response, but it's not. Nobody's arguing that the Roman church has moral problems and orthodoxy doesn't. That's not, nobody's ever made that dumb argument. What are you even talking about? 
That's a straw man. We're not making that argument. We're saying that you have a specific system. It's based on the guy in Rome and whether or not he's faithful to the faith. We have a different system, which is decentralized. And so it doesn't matter if a patriarch becomes a heretic. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't matter in the sense that it's not, you know, damaging to the church. It does matter. But I'm saying that it, the system doesn't isn't undone with systemic level contradictions, you see. Can, uh, can, can you guys not grasp this? And, and the, the Roman Catholics have these emotional reactions. Like they just emotionally react and spurg out when it's like, calm down, relax. Think about what, what's being said here. You have a system, we have a system. It's not a question of who has less moral problems. That's not the debate. Nobody's saying that. It's a question of, is the Roman see faithful to the first thousand years of Christianity, the teaching of the apostles? And is it a guide and a... Uh, office for clarity, unity, and all these things, given the post-Vatican II chaos? And the answer is no, it's not. And the two documents that we just covered admit all of our points. Thank you. In fact, it's almost like whoever was at, I'm not kidding. I don't think they really were. I mean, it's just people that are familiar with the scholarly, scholarly literature and the issues. But the Alexandria document, it's almost like they were watching me and Ubi and all of the stuff we've been talking about and Snack and David for the last five years. Because it's all the stuff we talk about. Go watch our live stream. And you can say all day long, oh, I don't care what a theological commission under Francis says. I don't have to accept it. So, but wait a minute. How is Francis okaying and giving a thumbs up to synods that are approving Completely heretical things. Well, Francis is a heretic. Okay, then Vatican I is not true. Henry, what's up, Henry? We're going to, I'm starting to get a headache, so we, we, we'll see how much longer I can uh, handle it. What's up, Henry? Unmute. All right, Henry dropped off. Orange raft craft. Hey, I, I had one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so this uh, is related to Russia, I guess, geopolitically. Mm. Um, I was reading a book by Robert Massey, and it's like mainstream history, so nothing conspiratorial, but he makes the claim in his... Uh, history of Tsar Nicholas that Lenin was exiled from Russia and then he had met with some Swiss bankers and then was smuggled back into Russia before the revolution started. Yeah, I that's Olaf, that's that. Olaf Ashberg. Yeah, it's covered in the Sutton book. I did a whole uh, did a whole talk on it. Okay, okay. So I was wondering um, what what you think or have come across um, earlier than that in the 1800s was were geopolitical powers like England using these revolutionary, you know, communist Jacobin movements against Russia and other countries? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Quigley has a whole chapter on it where he says that Protestant and <clears throat> other nations uh, were supporting the French Revolution monetarily. Okay. Um, there, do you know of any other texts other than the Quigley text? that might speak on this on the monetary support of revolutionary philosophy uh yeah yeah or just government support in general so i i don't know if this i just got the great game i don't know if that book speaks on the geopolitical usage You're talking about of the revolutionary movements the peter hopkirk book that's behind me uh correct yeah I don't know if he talks about the uh, the state um, support. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I 
Yeah, I, I had to think about that. I'm not sure. Okay, no problem. Um, well, if you ever do come up with something and uh, maybe make a video on yeah, it. Yeah, or, or I'll, I'll DM cool. you or something if I think of it. Yeah, good points. Rico, uh, so we're taking a, a disagreement. Say, Ricola, what's up? Uh, hey, Jay, can you hear me? Uh huh. All right. So I just had a couple questions relating to. I'm a Catholic, for reference. I have a couple questions relating to pre lust and mortification. Okay. But first, I just have a couple of clarification things. So I saw a clip of your wife supporting like paganism and stuff back in 2016 as she redacted those positions yeah it was before she was received into the church and she didn't support paganism she just was doing an analysis of the archetypal symbolism in different tarot cards she didn't even do tarot cards she was just showing the symbolism in it right so do you think that's spiritually dangerous to do that yeah i don't promote or say it's a good idea to be into tarot cards and that's why when she became orthodox in 2017 when she was baptized uh, she never she didn't even sell her old book which had which had one essay on that stuff okay and so also i had a question so about debating you called taylor marshall a coward for not debating you um is that correct well, I offered many, many times over 10 years to do a debate, and he wouldn't do it. So, yes, I think that is cowardly, but it also depends on the reasons why a person doesn't debate. So, right, the, so do you know his reasoning? I do not, because in the case of Taylor Marshall, we had interactions probably 10 years ago, like blog comments, and I don't, there wasn't any negative, like, you know, nothing mean or anything like that. It's not like, it's not like anybody was cussing anybody out or anything. Yeah, gotcha. It was just a situation where he sort of, I guess just decided that there was there, there's not my guess would be that for him there's probably no motivation to do a debate with me like what would he get out of that right like he he's doing fine with his audience he doesn't there's no need on his part to do it so it would really only benefit me and I think that if he didn't do well in that debate he would have a lot to lose so I understand the motivations but um, no, he's never stated why he wouldn't do it. But I've also told that he, I mean, I don't, I don't follow him. So I don't know. I don't even know if he does a lot of debates, but I'm told that he, t he, he does the same thing when other people try to debate that he just simply doesn't do it. So I'm just curious. And by that same logic, 10 years ago, you were a set of a contest and would have agreed with people like Peter Diamond. So why won't you debate him now? As I've stated for many in many cases that I don't think that they operate in goodwill and in good faith. And they've also lodged a lot of threats for people who will in any way try to disagree with them or clip their stuff. So why would I operate in good faith with people who don't operate in good faith? I mean, I guess I'd understand. I, I guess that makes sense, but I don't think you can get mad at people for not debating you when like some of your own bishops would probably say you don't act in good faith. But anyways, I'll, I'll no, hold on, hold on. Question. Which which bishops said I quote don't act in good faith. Now they're well. I mean, you attack the OCA all the time for you no. Know, but you just said not yeah. But so what? You just said that a bishop said I don't act in good faith. Nobody said that. Okay, so but hold on. You you, you, you made that claim. Where is that? You made that claim. Where is that? You made that claim. Where is that? Yeah. So so Jay, are you, are you honestly? Gonna you made that like claim. What yeah. what where is the proof of that claim? Of what claim? That OCA bishop said that I don't act in good faith. Where is you that? You made like three videos where you attacked a ton of people for making like a You said specifically that the OCA bishop, that you said a bishop has said. Yeah. Where is that? Isn't that, that's what, I, I remember I watched a video of yours where there was like a ton of OCA priests who yeah. uh, made. So you're here to find, you're trying to find here. dirt. Nobody said that, by the way. Okay. So do you have any arguments about the issues, or do you just want to argue about me? No, 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 sure. So, so, now, so now let's talk about the issues, okay? I wanted to get some clarification. Wait, no, you didn't want to get clarification. You wanted to try to score a gotcha to make me look bad. I, I know how you guys operate. Not, are, you really, of, are you a set of a contest? Are you a set of a contest? things about someone on the internet, right? Are you a set of a like, contest? I'm not a set of a contest at all. Oh, so you just wanted to utilize their stuff for the dirt? No. What I'm asking you is I watched their video on you, right? Not even knowing that they were a set of a contest group at the time, and I'm just trying. Oh, to so wait a minute, though. Wait a minute, though. But you. So hold on. So you know that like they don't even operate under any episcopate, right? Yes, I understand. Oh, I'm okay. Not supporting them. So they're only way. useful for uh, dirt and drama for you. 
No, I, as I said, I didn't know that they were Sedvic conscious when I even watched their video. Well, all you've all that. you've brought so far is dirt and drama. That's what I'm asking you. So that's what I'm okay, saying. Well, is that I'm, mean, yeah? You just admit it. You you just admit it. It's a very simple yes or no. You question. just know it's like, not. No, it's not. You want me to? No, it's not. Supporting paganism and tarot cards. So I asked about that, right? Right. So you're really talking. So clips from right? yeah, clips from almost ten years ago. Right. Good job. Okay. Yeah. So again, you guys never have anything except Who's dirt and guys? drama. You as a trad cat. Okay. Why is that funny? You you haven't had because a you haven't brought a single you, argument. You, do you want to actually talk about the issues? I mean, I was asking. You came for you came with no issues. Questions because we've been know we've been here. You guys are so scummy, dude. We've been here for three hours talking issues. Bring your issue. Okay. So let's talk about the concept of pre lust. Okay. Is it spiritually dangerous to pray the rosary? It can be because of imaginative prayer. So can it not be? Yeah, I think that it's possible that a person could, the, the phrases themselves don't necessarily lead to pre but it's bound up with Roman Catholic spirituality and, and uh, imaginative prayer. Okay, so in what way? In the way that uh, Ignatian spirituality says, engage in imaginative prayer. What do you mean? What, what does way? Ignatian spirituality have to do with the rosary? It's a Dominican prayer. It's imaginative prayer is Ignatian spirituality. Yeah, exactly. But that has nothing to do with the rosary. The rosary is not a part of Ignatian spiritual. Tradition. I'm aware of that, but it doesn't matter because the there are plenty of Catholics who will say use imaginative meditation with the rosary okay, as well. And there are plenty of Orthodox, which you think are ecumenist retards, and you completely ignore their opinions. So, like you saying, oh well, some Catholics. So what does this have to do? Rosary. None of this has anything to do with the actual dogmatic teachings of your church. Okay, what dogma? is spiritual like imaginative <laughs> prayer where is that dogmatized jay it's part of your tradition i don't care if it's a dogma or not but i, I would just said it. You just, you just no it. i'm talking about the, the dog i'm talking about the dogmas i'm saying that this is not even that big of an issue i'm not here i do you hear me debating the rosary all the time i don't care about no, the rosary I, i've just heard I, I remember i watched a clip of you where you were talking about the rosary and about the sacred heart devotion yeah and every any any time you come to an orthodox church they're going to tell yeah now the sacred heart actually is uh in Pius the 12th's letter david did a whole video showing that that is actually part of your papal teaching well, that's not actually the case, but I want to stick on. The uh, you're saying there's not. You're saying that there's. You're saying there's not an encyclical about. You're saying no, no, no. You're saying there's not an encyclical about the Sacred Heart. I'm saying I have not read that encyclical, and I'm not. Here to uh, you talk just about said it. that I'm doesn't. Talk about I am here to talk about it. To I'm not changing the topic. You want to? You do, you said Sacred Heart, did you not? I said that's a, the video in which you talked about the Rosary and Ignatian spirituality yeah. in general. Yeah. So this is a better example than the Rosary. Because okay, the so the you're rosary, that your point on the rosary doesn't make any sense because you said it does make sense. It's, it's not a, the rosary is not an issue of dogma in terms of imaginative prayer, but it's a practice that your church cultivates, and it's a okay, it's so a practice. Is, define imaginative to prayer for me. How does the how does the spirituality of the Roman Catholic Church define it? You're saying that it's not part of your spirituality. No, I'm asking you to define it for me so I know what you're talking it's, about. It's, for example, when uh, Alfonso Segori encourages you to imagine yourself in various situations such as burning in hell and so forth. Does he do that? He does, yes. Yeah. Sure. So that's imaginative that's prayer. Like, again, it doesn't, I, I'm not, I want to talk about the dogmas. It's just a tradition. I want to talk about the dogmas. Okay. So that's I don't base, that's a manifestation of your dogmas. So I don't okay, care. So I don't is, care is about all this. Imagination bad in prayer? Did I say that? Well, no, I'm, I'm asking clarification because I don't understand. I want to talk it. about the. I'm sorry that you don't understand it. So, but I want to talk about the Sacred Heart. So you said that it's. <laughs> so now why are you laughing? You brought. Yeah, I am going back to that because you brought it up, right? Is you said there is. You said that it's it's not part of your teaching. I said I have not read the encyclical, so I'm not going to make a comment on something that I haven't read, Jay. That seems pretty basic. Well, I would think you would be familiar with something uh, like that, given the fact that you seem to be very knowledgeable on Roman Catholic spirituality. I mean, that's where you're coming from, right? Well, what I said was the video in which you talked about that. I remember somebody linked me that video, and that was in the title. So that's what I remember the video from. I have not read the yeah. encyclical, so I am not ready to take okay. the position. So do you support Sacred Heart? Dude. Like, I, okay, so you're not gonna you're not gonna answer any questions about you're not gonna answer any questions about you're not gonna answer any questions about Roman Catholic teaching. You're not gonna. It's part of your. It's not has nothing to. It's part of your tradition. 
Okay, so I don't know every single tradition of the church. No one does. Okay. So true. is imaginative prayer part of it. So it's, there's nothing wrong with me critiquing it. It doesn't have to be dogma for me to critique it. So every tradition is dogma. It does not have to be dogma for me to critique it. But are you, you are you are you this dumb? Ago, you keep on saying let's talk about dogma. Let's talk about dogma, and then you're like, well, it's not a dogma. You so. no, I'm saying that the root something like Sacred Heart is part of your dogma, and so I, that's why I'd rather talk about that because look, the the phrases of the Rosary themselves, there's nothing inherently wrong with the phrases that you recite because most of it's from the scriptures. Okay. Okay, so to clarify, what is harmful about imaginative prayer? What does it do? Because of the harmful? tendency towards prelest, and that's why it's never been part of the what Orthodox tradition. Mean, Can you explain that? You know what? I, I, wait a minute. So you've been listening to me for all these years, and we've done countless. I haven't. I haven't. I didn't know you existed until a month ago. Okay, but so, and that's why you took, yeah, and so you went to a bunch of people that you don't agree with, set up a contest to find all the dirt, right? I watched his video. I've watched a couple of your videos. Again, I didn't know about you or these set of accountants people or any of these people because I didn't really engage in YouTube theology. So I don't know. Right, so the reason for are. this is that imaginative prayer is based on a different anthropology. So orthodoxy believes in a triadic view of man, body, soul, and spirit, spirit being the noose. And the noose exists for us to have direct face-to-face -face communication and relationship so with God. Happen? Let me finish. Direct communication with God. So the intellect, which is good, and it has a, a, its place in our human psychology, it's not the highest faculty in man. In the Roman Catholic tradition, the way it developed after August, uh, Augustinianism took precedence, man became a duality, primarily where he was viewed as body and soul, and soul was basically identified with intellect. We can see this in the Summa, for example. That's why your church doesn't teach body, soul, spirit, or noose. So noose has a, it's a faculty that we have that's for direct knowledge and communication with God. It's an orthodox teaching. It goes all the way back to the Cappadocians, to the uh, Philokalia. It's in all of our spirituality, and it's not present in the Roman so Catholic. It's not in the, it was never in the Western Fathers. You will concede that? Uh, it's in Benedict of Nursi. It talks about the uncreated energies and seeing the, the uncreated light. Okay, could you, could you send me that? I, I don't really believe you. I don't think that's true. This is well known. He's Benedict of Nursia okay. cited as seeing the uncreated light. So, so you, th so what you think? I just make this up. I mean, I think you deliberately misrepresent church fathers for your own for the sake of who, who, position. When who did I misrepresent? Uh, well, I, like I said, until you present evidence for this, you can't just claim all of this. And so, it's well cited in the literature. We covered the literature for years here. Okay. Well, my bad. I haven't watched you know years of your video. To understand. Well, then how are you in a okay, position? So how are you? No, how are you in a position? How are you in a position to say that I'm dishonest with the church fathers if you're not familiar with my work? I'm in because based on what I have seen of you, you deliberately misrepresent the various and, things. And get what and what, what like what example? Okay, please let me ask you. You haven't given an example. What's the example? You keep never really actually you keep explained. making claims. What's the example of this? Okay, Jake, can I please ask my question? No. You cannot, because I want to know the example of where I misrepresented the church fathers. You say I keep doing this. I mean, where? I, okay, okay. Where? So, where? I think I think you misrepresent Augustine where? a lot. Where? I mean, do you want me to... I, I'm on my phone. I can't pull up articles or... Well, you should at least be able to say what theological point I missed. What did, what did, what did I say that he was wrong about? Yeah, so you made a claim um, that he was wrong about... I mean, obviously you disagree with him about original sin. Uh, you disagree with him about okay. his interpretation. And where did I misrepresent what he was saying? Uh, where did... Because, well, I just said that you... You blatantly disagree with what he says, and I think you. So disagreeing with him means I misrepresented him in your dumb mind. Uh, disagreeing, no, disagreeing with him when you're citing him as an authority on one thing and not an authority on something else is pretty silly, Jay. That that literally made no sense. So you said yeah, I so misrepresented so Augustine. You, you, opinion, dude, you can't even follow through with what you're saying. Thing, but then say, oh well. His opinion on this other issue that I disagree with him on doesn't matter at all. That's that so you're just saying general things. You're giving no specifics. I'm happy to address the specifics. For example, in On the Trinity, when he says that there are no theophanies in the Old Testament, I think it's book three, he says it's angelic manifestations. Do you agree with that? I don't know. I haven't read that passage. No, I don't. Whoa, whoa. So have you read On the Trinity? On the Trinity? I, I don't know. I'm not in a place to so, oh, but you th But you know that I've misrepresented him because you haven't read it. So you're a liar. You don't actually know okay. what you're talking about. Jay, uh, mean, you talk about why do you keep saying thing. my name? You said that I lie and misrepresent the church fathers. You've yeah. not read the works, so you're not in a position to say that. 
I have. I have read several. You just said I haven't read the, the ones that we're talking about. The, the works of Augustine. You just said I've not read on the Trinity. That's not what I said. What did I, when did I say you haven't read anything about the Trinity, Jay? What are you talking I about? I said you just said I've not read on the Trinity. You. You as in you. I never said. No, no, no. You. I never said that you haven't read anything. No, I'm not talking about me. I mean you. You have not read on the Trinity. Yeah, and I didn't come here to debate that. That's not what I just well, said. Well, then you're not in a position to. You, you are debating it. You, you said that I misrepresented him. You're not in a position to yeah, say that. I, I didn't. Did I talk about the Trinity, though? Was that one of the examples I gave? On the Trinity is a book, dummy. On the Trinity is a book. The book. It's a title of a book. I'm not talking about the Trinity. Yeah, Jay. It's unbelievable. You guys are unbelievable. You have not read the book, and so you're not in a position to say it. Yeah, I didn't talk about the Trinity, though, Jay. You did. Do you think, do you realize that on the Trinity is about a bunch of things like theophanies? Yes. That's why I brought it up. Yes, but the thing is, is you're citing a passage from that book that has nothing to do with the topic that I brought up. I'm interested. It is part of the topic you brought up because it's one of the, it's the, it is because I talk about it in Augustine as a problem all the time. I harp on it all the time. Okay. So you can bring up an objection that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about if you want. It has everything to do with what you're talking about. You're a liar, dude. Why do you guys lie? You guys are such freaking liars. It has everything to do. It has everything to do. It has everything. You can't. Where have I represented him? You can't say it has everything to do with what we're talking about. You've not read the, you haven't read the freaking book. You're not in a position to say it's not accurately represented. You're such a liar. Okay. I mean, again, have you, you read the book? Discount, you can discount the opinions. You tell me the, Church the opinions in the Catholic Church. So again, nothing to do with what we're talking about. You tell me what Augustinian works you've read, and let's go to them. What have you read? Jay, Here we go. Saying my name. He can't say anything he's read. Let's go to, do you want to go to City of God? Do you want to go to City of God? Yes, sure. I've read that work. You have. you read all of City of God. Yeah, at one point, I... I've read it, yes. Okay. All right. And what does he say about, uh, for example, Christ's presence in terms of how he relates to all human nature? Do you think that all human nature will be resurrected? Wait, wait, wait. So, Jay, so is this like... I'm asking you specifically. Well, you've read the book. You interrogate people because you don't want to answer questions about positions. I already answered your dumb questions earlier. Now I want to know no, no, about you. About you made the claim. No, I'm. I don't let you. I don't. I don't let you. I don't let you make claims that you can't back up. So no. You okay. Don't. So can we talk about prelist as a theological concept? Not until I get the idea okay. that you are clear. Not until you interrogate me about every single Well, everything that I've interrogated you about, you have been completely, you, you haven't had an answer to. An answer to what? You, you said you read City of God, and I'm asking you if Augustine teaches that Christ is united to all human nature. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know oh, what he said okay. on that. But you read the book. I, sure. Yeah. Okay. Believe it or not, Jay, you can. It is possible. What's to what does the first half? What does the what does the first half of City of God deal with? I don't remember. I have no you idea. haven't read it. You would know no. what the first because it's divided into two books. So you're again a liar. No, I'm not, Jay. What does I, the first half of the book deal Jay, with? Like, dude. So dude, yeah, just repeat my name. You are not making Roman talk. Catholicism Jay, look good. Jay, 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 because you're not in a position to say that I'm wrong. But I'm not even, I'm not the one who brought up those topics. You, you did. Topic you said, I know more about you're a liar. You said you misrepresent the church fathers. I asked you for examples. You said Augustine. We go to Augustine. You don't even know what's in the books. That's not even the position that we were talking about. I don't right? care. I don't, it, okay. it demonstrates that you are in a position to comment on it. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what it demonstrates. You keep saying, I, okay, okay, okay. I admitted, okay. I admitted in the very beginning that I will not comment on issues other than these topics. That then I'm you're not prepared. You, then you're not in a position to say that I misrepresent the church fathers. It's very simple. Okay, so I will redact that statement. Now can we talk about free lust? Sure. Okay, so practically speaking, what, it, the, what exactly is and isn't imaginative prayer? The idea that the main faculty of my contact with God is the imagination or the intellect is not true. It's against okay, our so anthropology. What is, what is the are you going to, because of the doctrine of the noose, 
So we have a different anthropology. And that, okay, yeah. that reflects okay. into a different approach to prayer in the liturgy. So if, while I am praying, I am thinking about God, and there's like a picture in my head, is that pre-lust? You're not supposed to engage in picturing God in your head, correct. What does it mean? Okay, so what about words? Can picturing I, can words I pray, in your head? Think of words that come to my mind? The goal of prayer is to unite with the uncreated energies via the noose. Yeah, okay, so I'm asking you, so if, for example... So it praying, is to right? transcend, okay. it is to transcend the conceptual things. Okay, but Jay, I'm, I'm asking you... A Why do you question? keep saying my name? Like, me and you are the so only ones here. We're the only ones here. And you keep yeah, so repeating my I'm name saying? incessantly. Okay. So what do I... What, if I'm praying, right, is it pre-lust to pray like the words that come to my head or do I have to have a formulated prayer? I don't know what you mean by praying the words that come into your head. So for well, us, so say, uh, you know, prayer, listen, there, there is no pre-written prayer. I'm just praying whatever. Okay. I'm well, about, like, most of Orthodox theology or is liturgical prayer book prayers. Okay. So when you go okay, to the so service, it is pre-lust then. What's pre-lust? So it is pre-lust if someone were to pray and not have some pre-written prayer, but rather just say whatever comes to the top of their head. That is no, you can, you can, you can, you uh, can do extemporaneous prayer. That isn't, Why? that's imagination, Jay. No, that's not what we're talking about with imagination. We're talking about logismoi. That's what we're talking about. Okay. What is that? I'm not familiar with that terminology. So why are you debating me? You don't know any of this stuff. You came here to well, try to own Eastern me and debate me. Eastern Orthodox people use. It's not my fault that you're not aware of these terms. You came here with this attitude trying to dig up dirt and own me. And you, no, you came here with all these claims. You came with all these claims. You're using terminology only. It's not my fault you don't know the terms. I'm sorry. What, uh, how is that my fault? Well, I mean, yeah, sure. It's easy for you to say that when you've converted back and forth like four times. Yeah, you know. Here we go again. Right. So, so I'm a piece of shit. So you got it. What do you, what else you want? Why are you talking to me? I'm asking you about Why are you talking to me? Specific question. I, I'm not interested in engaging you anymore because all you have is okay. the low blows when you're shown that you're a complete moron and you don't know anything about what okay. you're talking about. I mean, all right. Uh, if you don't want to discuss pre list that's fine. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I be, because I, I give you the terms and you say, what is that? What is yeah, that? What is that? What is that? What is that? Why didn't you just come? Why didn't you come to me? And why didn't you come to this discussion in good faith? I mean, it's like you're completely. No, you're not. It's. I can't figure out if you're bad willed or just really dumb. I asked you to define a term that you used, and you called me an idiot, Jay, and said that I'm not. Because your whole approach was ridiculous. Do you do you not see why? What a term means that you used because Catholics you didn't do that didn't you didn't do that you came here with a bunch of insults and dirt and then what then insult? I never insulted oh, you, you just said you changed your religion like four times you're trying to insult me dude with yeah, your soy you're voice trying to parade around like you know the Catholic and the Orthodox terms not all people uh, read oh wait hold on hold on so hold on so so really is you're mad that I know these things so that's the root no, of it that's not true. you're an envious I, you're an envious soy man true. I mean, again, so hold on. So you're saying that you're saying I parade around. You're saying I parade around. I parade around. I parade around and don't know these things. Is that what you're saying? I'm humble enough, Jay, to say that. You're not humble at all. Nothing. You are the definition of a virtue signaling victim soy man. You're not. You're not humble at all. You're the opposite of humility. You got wrecked because you didn't. Know. I don't have to. T- it's not my. So I. So a debate is me defining terms for you. A debate. A term yeah, 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 yeah. It says yeah, debate. What does the Catholic. title? What does the title say? What is the title of what? This this Twitter space. Um, like debating God, Catholic, atheist, Protestant, Muslim versus Orthodox. Yeah. So you came to a debate, and you want me to define a bunch of terms for you after you brought a bunch of so-called dirt and drama that was I all bullshit. You to define one term. You guys are scummy. That's not what you did. You came with 10 questions about dirt and drama first, didn't you? Yeah, because... Yeah, because that's scummy. That's because you guys are scummy. That's why. Stop saying my name. Dude, you you, you can't find answers to what Logi are online. Do you not know how to use Google? I can't get answers to the questions about, like, whether or not your wife is... We will... Yeah, so that's all you have. You guys are... You guys are freaking demons, dude. Just scum. 
So what happens? He's mad because, so he comes with prepackaged dirt, five or six questions about dirt. He could Google the word prelest. Ortho wiki comes up with what prelest is. And all that was was a way to try to make me look bad. That's all that. I hope everybody sees that. So you're saying, why are you getting mad at? Because I know this scummy approach of trad cats. This is all they ever do. And isn't it interesting that they do the exact same name repeating? He didn't want to talk about any theology or any dogma. He wants me to define prelest, define logismoi for him. He could go look any of those things up easily. And he wants to kick, he wants to lead off with, is your wife a witch? So stupid. Go look it up right here. And then you notice throughout the conversation, the envy actually comes out, right? The bad faith envy comes out where he says, I haven't read all these things. I don't know. I've read City of God. I don't know what's in it. Anybody remotely familiar with City of God would know that the first half of the book, okay, the first four or 500 pages, is about the history of the Roman Empire and its relationship to paganism with a bunch of classical citations from classical mythology and classical authors. The second half of the book is the history of the church, the City of God. So he just spilled out that he was nothing but soy envy and his rage and cope and envy was the real motivation for why he did all that. So his his approach, and this is a big problem in the religious sphere, is all of these passive-aggressive virtue victimhood signalers. Read the dark triad paper that we just covered yesterday. That guy is an exemplification of the dark triad as a victim virtue signaler. You parade around like you've read all this stuff and you just define it for me. I'm the victim as I talk about how you have a bunch of dirt in your closet. Everybody in this stream can see that that was pure scumbaggery. And yeah, that's why I call you out as scumbag. And the whole chat, he was oozing soy. Absolutely. Freaking scumbag. Yeah, you're gonna you come on a, a stream and start start talking about my wife is a lich and why did you do this ten years ago? I mean, did none of that has anything to do with the actual issues? Then it's well, just want you to find the words for me, even though you misrepresent the church fathers. When did I misrepresent the church fathers? Augustine. Uh, so let's give some examples. I don't know. I haven't read these things. <laughs> What's up, metaverse? What's up? Hey, um, so yeah, just I'll get to it. Um, I basically have two things I want to ask. One relates to the title, sort of, and one doesn't. Is is that fine if I go a little off topic? Uh, no, it needs to be on topic. Okay, then I'll I'll just stick with it. Um, so uh, in the 1960s in Germany, uh, like the Protestant War in Rome, and like the war between that, I was like uh. I know, like, a lot of, like, lineage of uh, world leaders today come from that region, and a lot of their names change. Uh, would you be able to just speak a little bit on, like, uh, the motive? No idea what you're talking about. All Might, what's up? I'm not in the best mood now. I'm getting kind of sassy now. I'm sassy now. Go ahead, next dude. All something. Yeah, what's up, Jay? What's up? Uh, nothing. I'm a, uh, I'm actually a uh, former atheist. I'm a recent convert, not convert, but I'm a I'm an Orthodox Catholic human right now, and I'm kind of like halfway in between a Christian paradigm and an atheistic paradigm. I'm kind of still stuck in the secular worldview. But I'm trying to switch over to a more Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was just asking, how do you? Uh, I'm not gonna say reconcile, but how um, do you think it's just these, uh, these higher, higher thinking? I don't know what the exact movement was, the Enlightenment movement, but these uh, modern scientists, when they start coming out with articles saying that uh, Yahweh was originally a, a pagan god of the Canaanites and he was adopted by the uh, Israelites during their Babylonian enslavement and such like that, 
and then uh, all these uh, like the behemoth and uh, leviathan were all these mythological creatures of the uh, of the middle east of the time like um you think that's just them um trying to spin a, an anti-christian narrative to kind of uh, destroy a uh, religious the religion foundation by saying that all the roots are man-made and therefore what we have now is just a uh, the, found, the foundation where our faith is built on right now is uh it's yes. all built on falses yes so yeah okay that's what i say i'm still because it's like uh i'm sorry dude i can't it's just such like that look so when it comes to textual scholarship, this has been a long thing in process, right? Where they've been trying to undermine the text going back to uh, Julius Bellhausen, right? So Bellhausen is one of the earliest, he's sort of the father of the documentary hypothesis of JEPD. And so ever since him, we've had really two centuries of fads in scholarship and whatnot to try to explain, okay, well, so if these are not true, then what is it? And so you get a proliferation of academic and scholarly theories about what all these things are. And well, so he must, Yahweh must be a uh, uh, adaptation of, you know, the Canaanite uh, pantheon because he has the name L. And so, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that stuff, interestingly, before the Jesus quest and all of that, uh, well, I should say after the Jesus quest, a lot of that stuff uh, got a lot of UN funding, like the promotion of all of Elaine Pagel's stuff uh, and the Gnostic gospels that got a lot of foundation and international funding. So yes, there is a concerted effort absolutely to undermine and then explain using those things. Daniel. Daniel? Uh, I'm gay. Do you think I'm going to hell? <sighs> Henry. Yo. What's up, man? Can you hear me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Am I good? Is it trash? Uh, I don't know. Is it trash? You tell me. We're, we'll judge that after you talk. Two questions. Uh, well, actually, are they on question? the topic? What is a question? Are they on the yeah, topic? On topic, on topic. Um, so my first thing, I guess I'll just get the request out the way. Um, so I was trying to put my like, like my some of my friends onto you that like go to the church that I go to. Um, but our church is like in a, it's an Orthodox church. Um, it's Antiochian. It's it's legit. Um, but it's in a strip mall, and you always make these like Protestant strip mall jokes. So I just, you know. I think you know you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but the point of those jokes is that Protestants don't have the idea of building a temple that will be there for generations. When when Orthodox churches are in strip malls, is because they're forced to be there, and the they always plan to build their own temple when they have the means to do so. So the joke still applies. Oh, okay. All right, gotcha. Um, and then my next uh, question, or this is my actual question. Uh, my question is um, about the uh, the genealogies. Um, so I don't believe in evolution or anything like that. But um, my main like kind of thing with like the whole orthodox paradigm that I'm kind of struggling with is like the idea of like a really young Earth. It kind of I just yeah I don't really uh, I I've tried to force myself to believe it, but I just I don't really I don't know, man. I, I'm not really I don't really see it. So I was uh, looking into, like, interpretations of the genealogies and stuff like that. Um, and I know you don't like uh, inspiring philosophy, and I understand that. I, get, I, I can see why. Um, but he has, like, a, a video on the genealogies, and he's basically trying to explain that they don't really, like, that they're more of, like, a tradition. They're not really, like, a, like the years in the genealogies don't really, like, aren't really meant to be, like, legit, like, interpreted that way. It's more of, like, a way to honor, like, past patriarchs like it's more of like a cultural thing but and i basically wanted to ask you my main question about that it wasn't whether if you like that idea or not it was if there's like an anathema against ideas like an like an interpretation of them like that in the orthodox church right so all of those interpretations come out of modernism and what i was talking about a minute ago with the documentary hypothesis and the jesus quest and all this stuff which was always intended to undermine the text so so you have a problem with 
early young earth creation uh why is that um i, I don't know i just can't i just don't I, i'm be honest with you man like you know like when you just don't, well hold you on just don't if you you've got to have a reason like okay so you i get it you doubt you doubt that and what's the reason what's the reason uh, hey. I, I don't know i just feel like we're going against like i I feel like we're going against like all of modern science and like I don't really care. Oh, hold on, hold on. Go hold on. Time, it's like, hold on. So yeah. not all of modern science has any coherent theory about the age of the earth. So who counts as quote modern science? All the secular uh universities? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. When the secular uni when the secular universities come to the majority opinion that um, chromosomes don't determine uh, male or female, is it true now? Jay, I don't really want to argue about you like about this stuff. I just like, well, hold on. Just no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said well, I'm just asking the reason. You see, you said we shouldn't go against all modern science, and if modern science starts to say that. No, uh, this is just a personal quip. Like this is personal. Okay, it doesn't. I'm not saying anyone. Needs I'm, to I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not being mean to you, dude. It says debate, and so you're saying that you doubt the the testimony that's in scripture. That's fine. I'm not being mean to you. Sh you should want to have your ideas challenged, and so I'm just saying. What's the reason you doubt? And you said, well, we seems like we're going against the you know majority of modern science. Okay, but the majority of modern science is starting to say that you don't, you can uh, be become a woman if you're a man. Is that is it true now? Because the majority says no, that's it. That's not true. It's not true. So how do we know when to go with the majority of modern science? Mm. Man, I wasn't ready to argue. I'll be honest, man. Um, it's okay. So you so let's go back to your question. Is there an anathema about? Uh, the age? No. So we covered a minute ago that there's no specific statement that the earth is six or 10. The Byzantine calendar kind of goes back to and presupposes a, uh, an early date. Uh, and then you have the sixth council basically saying that Adam and Eve were created in the garden of Eden. And it's not a, it's not a myth or an allegory like origin said. So that's condemned. Um, but I would say, I mean, there's plenty of critiques of uh, evolutionary theory out there. If you want to start I would, the, I approach these questions from the philosophical perspective. So I would say if you read the essay by Titus Brockhart in the book, Sort of Gnosis, uh, that's the best critique I've ever seen of evolutionary theory. Yeah. And what would be your main argument against like the, I guess just like the whole age of the earth thing. I, um, I've heard one argument before and it was basically that the flood kind of made things deteriorate. Uh, I don't know what the word is. Deteriorate faster. That's like the main argument I've heard from like the Orthodox side, but I'm not well, too sure if that's... So it really depends on our presuppositions. And so when people do, you know, radiocarbon dating, they already have baked into how they go about that process, the assumption of uh, an old earth. So if you, if you bake into your instruments the idea that, oh, the radioactive decay only occurs at this amount over millions of years, then it has to be millions of years old. It's just based on these presuppositions that we don't know if they're true or not. One of those presuppositions is that, uh, you know, nature operated in a uniform way millions of years ago. And so it's just ironic to me how many people who believe in empirical data uh, don't realize that there is no absolutely no empirical data of anything from that time period. You understand that there's nothing that we have from that time period. You can't you can't observe anything. You can't observe anything in the past. There's no direct observation of the past. Period. So how are we going to observe and do observational science on what happened supposedly 11 million years ago or a billion years ago? Got you. Um, so what I'm kind of hearing right now is that uh, for the question I had previously, it was uh, there's there's traditions that sort of indicate um, a young earth, but there's no formal like anathema against holding an older earth view. As long as you hold to a real Adam and Eve and no death before the fall, sounds like I'm fine. Well, I mean, I'm trying to be as uh, lenient as I can be because I know a lot of people will have disagreements on this issue. Uh, I think that the more consistent you are with it, you, you would have to be forced to a creation model. 
and an, a young earth, but it took me many years to come to that position. So I don't knock people who are, you know, kind of doubting or they have their reservations on it. So that's what I'm saying is that I think we should give people uh, time and benefit of the doubt that they're not trying to be heterodox or whatever. I mean, the main issue, though, will be theologically that um, in terms of the genealogies, for example, you know, Jesus has to be the descendant, uh, not just of Adam or uh, of Abraham, but also David, right? So the, the, the genealogies are there to show and demonstrate that he fulfills the prophecies of the Messiah. So if we get rid of the genealogies, we, we sort of lose a lot of that power in terms of the prophetic fulfillment. Does that make sense? So it becomes theologically problematic. And although, uh, I don't care for IP at all, uh, if I was to give him the best, uh, grant him good motives and say, maybe he has good motives. Um, the danger there is that to say that the genealogies are just sort of cultural expressions of honor or something to me, that doesn't do us any good when it comes to showing, uh, the biological descent of the Messiah fulfilling the prophecies. That's very important. It, Jesus isn't the Messiah. If he doesn't have the biological descent to fulfill the prophecies of the promises given to Adam, to, uh, uh, Noah, Abraham, uh, David, etc. You see. Got you. Uh, can I ask? Can I like bring up one more topic? Sure. Or no? Is that it? Okay. Um, I saw this thing that was kind of trending on the internet. Um, a lot of this. This isn't with, like with Orthodox. Maybe you don't care, but I think it could become an Orthodox issue. Um, and a lot of Catholic churches, um, a lot of Protestants are taking like communion, and like their attitude when they're sort of questioned about it is they're just like, oh, you know, we don't care. We don't think this is actually Jesus. We think this is just to remember him. And I think this is crazy. Like they're just going in there and taking communion, even though they're not down with the theology and the, the priest doesn't know. Right. Cause like there's like so many people in these churches, you know, and I just wanted your opinion on that. And you said that the Protestants are going in and doing this where? Um, in Catholic churches. And I'm wondering if this would ever be become like an Orthodox issue. No, in every liturgy, the priest says that um, this communion is for uh, baptized Orthodox Christians who have prepared their heart through fasting and preparation. So, no, that will not be. I mean, it, it, we, could, we could get a bunch of people not being faithful to Orthodoxy and uh, allowing Protestants to come do something like that, but it's not supposed to happen. So, um, it won't happen anytime soon, but Dan, uh, Dan R, $10. Thank you for your work, Jay. Do you have a video refuting boomer tantra vegetable christopher wallace i do not and i don't know who that is so i apologize i don't have any video on that boomer tantra vegetable that sounds fascinating it doesn't sound like it's going to be too high tier though jesus is lord 20 dollars. you are fire dire keep defending the faith glory to god for all things thank you for that appreciate that super chat uh, is five dollars i'm looking at orthodoxy however it is different from my retort non-denominational upbringing i sometimes get lost what are the fundamentals to this faith and then what are the things that need to be true for orthodoxy to be true in other words where should i start uh, i would get a, a, an orthodox study bible and as you read through it uh, read the study notes because usually 90 95 of the time they're really good and accurate um, i would get a, a book like my endorsed book the orthodox church which is a good introduction mere ten dollars I love the content. Thank you so much, Mirror. Much appreciated. Hitting that all day, $5. Do you have a summary of the essence energy distinction for the layman? I'm new to this orthosphere content and I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Uh, yeah, I would say the basic idea is uh, what we read in. If you get Dr. David Bradshaw's paper uh, on divine glory, and if you get his other paper, uh, 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 essence energy what kind of distinction um i would start reading those they're going to be a little difficult but the basic idea is just that god reveals himself to us via his operations or actions or energies which are in and imminent in the created order um but there's also an aspect to god which is unknowable which is his essence and so we see this from the old testament when we see that moses has the experience of seeing God face to face on the mountain. And at the same time, we're told that no one can see God and live. So there's some way in which God is revealed is revealable in another way in which he is always hidden. And that hidden aspect or that apophatic aspect to God is the essence. 
that revealed aspect is God's actions or energies that are personal towards us in the created order. If you read letter 234 of Basil, he covers this uh, in Cappadocian fashion. Um, so those are places to start. And uh, there's a lot of actual places in the Old Testament. I'm reading through um, certain rabbinical uh, texts, actually, believe it or not, that make a lot of these points without knowing it. For example, the Benjamin Summer book that I've been reading for the upcoming debate, Bodies of God in the World of Ancient Israel. I mean, he's a liberal. I'm not advocating his liberal textual scholarship, but he's admitting that there is a fluidity to the manifestation of God in the Old Testament such that it is not a bare Unitarianism. And quite a few uh, Orthodox Jewish and academic debates and discussions have been had recently. I mean, I have basically a whole stack of books here covering this. So all of these texts cover this issue in, in some form or fashion. Now, these are not going to introduce you to the essence energy distinction per se, but these books are dealing with that topic because in the Old Testament, we have many places where we see that God is embodied. We see the theophanies where God is present as the angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. We see the glory cloud of the Shekinah. Uh, we see God's presence there uh, above the ark, right? And in the temple. Uh, the Shem of God, the name of God will live in the temple. And yet Solomon says that you are still in the heavens and do not dwell in temples made by human hands. So it's a both and, right? So how is the God's imminent and transcendent at the same time? And yet we have these manifestations throughout the Old Testament, what are called theophanies. That's possible because of the essence energy distinction. And uh, it's best displayed in Moses on the mountain and in the New Testament epistles that I covered where Paul talks about the energies earlier in today's discussion. Jesse Branch, $5. Do we get a J Funko Pop? Somebody, this Funko Pop is here because he gets destroyed every time there's a debate. Uh, I mean, literally, I crush him when we do the live events. So I don't, this is like the fourth Nick Cage Funko Pop I bought because I destroy them. So now you know the secret. By the way, come to our live event. If you're in the Los Angeles area, we'll be live July 6th. You can get your uh, tickets in the show description for our five-hour event with comedy, with philosophy, with uh, book signing, and then Jamie Kennedy will also be there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, also, remember to get your Chalk.com, the best supplements out there. Head on over to Chalk.com and get the Seven Wonders if you're looking for overall supplementation. Get the Tonkat Ali if you're looking for the Tonkat 100 if you're looking for uh, testosterone boost. I highly recommend that, especially for the, the soy Catholics that call in and uh, act like women and passive aggressive weirdos. I highly recommend that you stop whatever chicken tendy diet and uh, fast food diet you're on and get on over there and get some of that tongue kettle. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off. That's J A Y 50. J A Y 50. Get you 50% off. Also use the promo code J jump promo code J53 Life. That's J53 L I F E to get uh, an extra discount for recurring subscriptions and any trad cats who would like to uh, box in person i'd be happy to box that guy in person by the way uh i'm gonna be we're, we're uh, hopefully this barbecue will happen and i welcome the trad cats literally who want to come and, and box. let's 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 take it to the boxing match so if we can set this up in atlanta maybe <laughs> uh yeah bring your boxing gloves jesse branch no wait we already did that good chase Haggard, I don't know who that is. Three dollars. I used to be a psychedelic eating hippie, and now I'm something different. However, this Roman Catholic guy doesn't have any arguments. Chase is saying, right? So it's like, oh, you did this, you did this, you did this, which is all this really passive aggressive way to undermine anything you say. So it's like I come on and talk to you, and I let's talk about all of the dirt from your past. I just want to stick to the issues. I just want to stick to the issues. You notice he's like the third Roman Catholic that's done that in the last three weeks when we've done the open open spaces, open forums. Remember the other guy? There was a uh, uh, one of the trad cats from Canada, or no, he's a Nordic trad cat, right? Not a Chad cat, a Nordic trad cat. And what what did he do? The first thing he did was ask me a bunch of questions about dirt in my past, and then say, "I just want to talk about the issues." Dude, you guys are so transparent and obvious. No, you don't. That's not why you came here. You may have wanted me to answer your questions and because you're too lazy to go look up what Logis, Moy, and Prelust are. 
but you don't start out with a bunch of dirt because you just honestly want to be here to have your questions asked. And I'm just such a victim signifying virtuous victim status is what these people do. And once you can, once you see people doing this, it doesn't work. They don't get away with it. And I'll give you guys the paper. I highly recommend it. We just covered it one day ago uh, in the stream that we did with Kotel on the red pill stuff right here. Remember the stream? I did. Uh, I read this entire paper. I recommend you reading it for those that have not read it. Because from now on, this is my go-to for all of the religious uh, uh, soy people and one-uppers. You see, the men's rights sphere is applying this to the virtuous victimhood status of feminized gynocracy, right? Which it does apply to that because a society based around this notions of not hurting people's feelings and being fair and being totally egalitarian is actually promoted by the most Machiavellian narcissistic and psychopathic people. That's what the paper demonstrates. Constant virtuous victimhood status is done by people with the dark triad traits. And that is why so many of the trad cats act in this way. In fact, if you read this document, you will be reading the perfect description of the psyche of Michael Lofton. And you'll, that's why he's always sign, signaling his victimhood and his virtuous status when anyone disagrees with him, right? So when people disagree, it's always slander. Everything is slander, which that's not what slander is, by the way. You'll notice it's right here in this document. So now you have the perfect psychological critique and manifestation of identifying these creeps and weirdos all throughout the religious sphere just as valid as the critique of these creeps and weirdos in the social political sphere. The virtuous victim virtue signalers who are the piety signalers one-upping everybody on the internet, they are these people and they're the worst people. They are complete scumbags. And that's why Jesus says that they are full of dead men's bones inside because this is what the Pharisees did, right? The Pharisees are the equivalent to the people who get on the internet to signify how virtuous and pious they are. And then when you call them out or disagree with them, suddenly they're victims. And that guy, that guy was probably so deluded he can't even recognize how, how nasty he was. And playing the victim as he tries to undermine, bring up dirt from, the, from somebody's past. It's just so transparent, dude. Glitchy rhythm. Why do people think it's a kill shot to bring up that you've changed your mind or, or, the, or your church in the past? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if I Theoretically, if I changed my mind and my church 5,000 times, that would literally have nothing to do with what position I'm arguing. In fact, as I often say, let's just say that I'm Judas. Let's just say that I'm the, I'm the worst person ever. I'm Jeffrey Dahmer. Fine. Okay. Now, what does that have to do with any of the arguments and what's being said? And so the answer to your question that in terms of why do people do this, it's because it's an easy, lazy way to try to undermine and make someone look bad without actually engaging in any kind of argumentation or dealing with the topics themselves. Because you notice as we started to get into the theology and the topics, that guy completely melted down. Hasn't read any of the stuff. Not in a position to say that I'm misinterpreting the fathers when he doesn't even know what's in the text. Claims he's read all the city of God, but he doesn't remember any of it. I don't care if, if you've read it, you would at least remember that the first half of it is about the Roman pagan world and its, and its religious views as an apologetic as to why Christianity wasn't the source of Rome's fall. You would at least know that. So he, was, he, so he lied. He openly lied. Everybody saw him lie. He hasn't read city of God. Straight up lie. It's a 12, 1100, 1200 page book. I've lectured through the entire book for you guys. So what happens when you're shown to be lying and envious and you saw the envy come out, you, you talk like, you know, all this stuff and, and, and it's just not fair. And you should just define these things for me. And uh, uh, weakness, dude, you are the archetype of the trad cat and what's wrong with trad cats. Solomon $1. What's the best book on epistemology? I think the W.J. Wood book is a great introduction. Um, I don't have the Audi book. I have it on my Amazon to get list. I just have a million books that are on that list. I don't have money for everything on there. 
What are the same? Uh, yeah, I think the 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 set that is the uh, WJ Wood set's great. Diet soda light, one dollar. What is your reputation of emergentism in regard to the mind body problem? Um, emergentism doesn't really say anything. Uh, I mean, it says, oh, uh, consciousness is an emergent property uh, from the brain. Uh, emergent property that is what? So it really, it really, it's it's really this position of trying to have something that isn't reductionist, but doesn't actually say anything about what it actually is. So it's really a nonsense, nothing position. Bob Johnson, ten dollars. Thank you for the videos critiquing the OSA OCA. By the way, you notice that guy didn't actually clarify or make anything clear. The OCA bishops say you operate in bad faith. No, no OCA bishop said that. Uh, there was a OCA priest who said that I'm somebody that you shouldn't listen to. No, has nothing to do with OCA bishops saying operate. In bad faith. But by the way, if an OCA bishop did say operate in bad faith, I don't care. <laughs> so, uh, but that didn't happen. So again, just saying things, nothing, no, no. People come to debates and they want to be able to machine gun, gish gallop, vomit out, diarrhea, spray a bunch of stuff and not get into the specifics of ever backing up any of the claims. And you'll notice tonight, as happened multiple times tonight, several people tried to do that. The Muslim atheist dude, he tried to do that. We, we say, hey, bring it back, bro. Rewind it back. Make good on that claim you just made. And then he tries to, he tries to pull a freaking Vin Diesel torque spin out of here. Get out of here. No, let's get past that. No, no, I don't want to go past that. You called into debate. It says debate at the top of the, of the Twitter space. It says it on the YouTube channel. Open debate. You called into debate. We're going to debate the claims. No, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Yeah, so let's blow past the issues that are a problem. Exactly. I recently became a catechumen at the Serbian church. I met a lot of people that left the OCA during the COVID. Uh, it was the OCA's fault that people left during the COVID. Nothing to do with me. So they can blame me and other people all day long, but it's not my fault. Uh, I never told people, by the way, during all that stuff, not to go to OCA. The, I told, I might've said that one time about a specific person's church, but no, they brought all that on themselves. And then now they're looking for a person to blame when people leave their, their, uh, jurisdiction, tenfold hat, $5. Jay, I want to thank you. I was finally able to convince my Roman Catholic mother that there's problems in natural law and natural theology. Interesting. That's not usually the route that a mom goes <laughs> when questioning Roman Catholic theology. I owe it for you to push me to a better, uh, orthodoxy and actually read and write my faith. Hey, that's great. If that helps you out, then I appreciate it. Um, enjoy that, uh, Enjoy that process because uh, typically that's not how, I mean, if you've got a mom that's open to natural theology questioning, that's fascinating. She, You must have a, a, a somewhat intellectual academic mom. Also, guys, remember to follow Richard Grove over at uh, Tragedy and Hope uh, and over on Rockfin at Grand Theft World. Uh, I don't think there's any more. Do we have any more last minute haters? Oh, no. <sighs> so I think this guy has called in before. This Muslim dude. He's the first Muslim. Now, if it's the guy who says that we can do... I'm just trying to... I'm trying to gauge if I have the energy for the last Muslim dude. Do I have... Do I have any coffee left in the... Is there some juice in the tank? There's a little juice in the tank, so we'll try it out. We'll have to down all the espresso. All right, independent Muslim. Are you there? You got to unmute, bro. I thought we had a Muslim, independent Muslim. Where you at? What are you doing? He just left. Where you at, dude? I, thought, I drank that coffee for you, bro. Gajiran? Hey, Jay, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm 
an uh, Orthodox Inquirer, and I had two quick questions for you. Okay. Are, the first are, one is: Are they all on? Try... Are they on the yeah. topics? Sorry. Are they on the topics today? Uh, it's on Orthodoxy, so I'm not sure if that qualifies. Okay. What? So my first one is about the triadic uh, formula. So <clears throat> every divine activity being from the Father through the Son in the Spirit. Is it appropriate to apply that to how the faith came down to us? So is it appropriate to say that the faith came to us from Christ through the apostles in the church fathers? Is that an appropriate analogy? Um. I would hesitate to do that kind of analogy just because uh, the things that are proper to theology or theologia proper are distinguished from the economia. Uh, and so it's true that the economia reflects theology proper, but we can go too far with this at times. And so I would just say that the triadic mode of movement is really just about the intertrinitarian relations. So I'm hesitant to, I mean, I think there are things that we can see in the church that are patterns like the um, multiplicity of bishops having unanimity amongst the multiplicity. That's like the unity and multiplicity within the triad that's balanced. But I would hesitate to say that there's some direct parallel between the from, through, in, and the church. Okay, so better keep it to uh, the triad, okay? And my second question is... Uh... So in terms of church history and biblical history, there seems to be patterns. So like significant events happening every uh, thousand years. So for example, 2000 BC, you had Abraham, 1000 BC, King David. Around the year zero, you had the incarnation. Uh, 1000 AD, the Great Schism. And yeah, now we are in the second millennium. Do you... Do you uh, have any thoughts on these patterns or are there any patristic writings on patterns in reality or prophecy or things like uh, that? Yeah, some, some church fathers do speculate about the possibility of a kind of day age theory, as it's called, like uh, six days and then the seventh day being the end or whatever and loosely applying it to ages, ages or phases of history. Um, I'm hesitant to say that. It's very speculative, so I, I don't have any hard, fast opinion on that, no. Okay, that was it. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, good questions. All right. Um, any any last dissenters at the end of the day? So if not, we'll call it a day. Uh, this is the last chance. Let me give one last chance if you want to request to speak, if you disagree. Uh, Roman Catholic, atheist, Protestant, Calvinist, Muslim. If you have any objections, uh, hit request to speak, and I'll give you the last chance. The last opportunity, last bastion. Nobody, we got 73 people, nobody disagrees. No haters, baiters, no french fried taters. Joe, are you a, a, a dis dissenter? It's only for dissenters, Joe. Uh, hey, Jay, can you hear me? Are you a dissenter? Uh, yes, a uh, point of clarification. Okay. Um, I know in your previous uh, videos, I think it was in the one on Athanasius, you mentioned that sin is primarily seen as a privation. Um, no, so no, 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 hold to... on. Well, well, evil is seen as a privation. Okay. Right. So, so sin, sin, sin is, is not sin is not identical to evil, right? I mean, sin is an evil, but there's different types of evil. There's the evil of privation in the sense of lacking eyesight that's an evil if i'm blinded i'm i'm lacking eyesight there's also moral evil not metaphysical uh, negation evil but moral evil is an act of the will against the good or sin right so that there's different notions to what to what evils are uh and i think athanasius would hold to both of those okay so in light of that how do you explain Second uh, Corinthians five twenty one? For He hath made Him to be sin for us. So those are, uh, if you read John Damascus book three down towards the end, he has a really good explanation of not just that passage, but all of the passages that cover this. Like uh, He became a curse. Uh, he made him and you know sin to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God, right? So th that's by appropriation. In other words, it means that he took these on as if he was a guilty man, as if he was cursed. 
But you can't have the Son of God being cursed by the Father because this would deny the Trinity. Sure, yeah, and that's an excellent point against penal substitution, right? You, you'd be splitting the Trinity or you end up in Nestorianism both are. Right, so John Damascus says that these texts are, quote, by appropriation, meaning that it's as if he were sin or as if he were accursed. Yeah, I see. So one last thing, if I could fit it in one minute, is if, you know, we do accept the position of some form of substitution, but not a penal substitution. So which is it? I've heard people mention it's essentially a ransom, but a ransom to whom? Right, so there's, uh, again, the best thing to read on this is the last section of Book 3 of John Damascus because he, he discusses in what sense it is a ransom, in what, in what sense it is uh, a punishment, in what sense it is penal, uh, and exactly what happens in the death, which is the Christ's soul is severed from his human body. And so the second person of the Godhead descends in his human soul as it is separated to Hades, and there he undoes the power of uh, the devil in the kingdom of Hades. So the best place to read is Book 3 of John Damascus, the last five or six paragraphs. Awesome. It's Thank really good. So yeah. yeah, he's really good. And I think he really perfectly explains uh, all of those ideas in the way that we understand them. All right. Uh, I don't see anybody else. So thank you guys. A lot of fun tonight. We had some heated stuff. Uh, just wait. that people are going to be saying, oh, he's so mean. He's so mean. Uh, hey, look, getting heated, that's part of what men do. Men have debates. Men get heated. Men go out and have boxing matches. And I'm happy to have a boxing match with the trad cats. And I'm sure there's buff trad cats who will come and beat my ass. I don't care. Uh, but I'm ready to move to the boxing match with trad cats. Let's do it. Exposing truth, $3. Jay, are there any books the critique mesotheism or Gnosticism from a Christian point of view? Uh, I mean, yeah, countless church fathers critique Gnosticism. I mean, Irenaeus is against heresies is the first and, and most, you know, extensive magisterial critique of Gnosticism. Um, Basil and the Cappadocians in critiquing um, Eunomius and Neoplatonism inadvertently critique Gnosticism, you could argue, because because of the of, of some parallels between Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. And yes, I know that Plotinus wrote against the Gnostics. But if you look at what Plotinus is actually arguing, the, the main point of contention is just Gnostics saying this world is a prison and Plotinus saying this world is like the lowest of the emanations. So again, there's a, there's more overlap than disagreement. But Aqua, $1, uh, you've been told this to death, but I would like to praise the, the work that you do. When you debated Rashid, Azra Rashid, Paul Williams, and Shabir Ali, you were actually instrumental in making my Muslim friend receptive to the gospel. Thank you. Appreciate that. Your voice has been a mouthpiece for orthodoxy, and I thank you. Well, thank you so much, Aqua. I really appreciate that. That's always good to hear. We know that uh, we're producing... Uh, you know, good fruits over here, despite the fact that, yeah, I'm a human being and I get mad and I get angry and all that stuff. Sure, that happens. But I mean, that's also not even inherently sinful, right? I mean, Jesus got mad and overturned the tables of the money changers. So these soy men that act like and try to try to get you play gotchas because you get heated in a debate. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's just so pathetic. And I mean, no wonder people laugh at Christianity. We got these soy passive aggressive men acting like exactly what this paper describes, right? The dark triad of virtuous victimhood status. Those are the most, the people that are most crying about their victimhood status and how they're virtuous. The paper demonstrates proves they are the most mal 